Good afternoon and welcome to our October 25th, 2022 board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today, and to those who are watching this meeting via live stream on the MCPS website and MCPS TV. Let us begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will call the roll to recognize that we have a quorum, starting with Mr. Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Mandrowski. Good afternoon. Ms. Silvestri. Good afternoon. Dr. Daka. Good afternoon. Ms. Evans. Good afternoon. Dr. Joftis. Good afternoon. We can now begin the meeting. I need a motion to amend the agenda to switch the items five and six. Six is needed first. So can I get a motion to amend the agenda? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. <coughs> now can I get a motion to approve the amended agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous, thank you. At this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. McKnight. Uh, thank you, President Wolf, and good afternoon. Uh, we do have a number of recognitions in which I will share. The first beginning with International Augmentative and Alternative Communication Awareness Month. Whereas the United States Society for Augmented, Augmentative and Alternative Communication has designated the month of October 2022 as International Augmentative and Alternative Communication Awareness Month, celebrating the theme, Show Your Voice. The educators and families of Montgomery County Public Schools work collaboratively to ensure that our classrooms are providing communication practices to effectively facilitate access to the curriculum. Montgomery County Public Schools provides our students with highly qualified professionals experienced in determining and implementing the most effective means of communication, including alternative and augmentative communication for our learners impacted with severe expressive communication disorders. Whereas communication in all forms is a basic human right and specifically, it is protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act, and therefore be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Edu the Montgomery County Public Schools joins with the United States Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication declaring the month of October 2022 as International Augmentative and Alternative Communication Awareness Month in Montgomery County Public Schools and encourages all community members and Montgomery County Public Schools staff members to learn more about the alternative and augmentative communication, highlighting the successes that alternative communication users can have in career and life. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. The next recognition is National Native American History Month and Day. In 1986, the United States Congress passed a law signed by the former President George H.W. Bush designating November as Native American Heritage Month and called upon federal, state, and local governments to observe November with programming, ceremonies, and activities that commemorate and celebrate the cultural heritage and contributions of Native peoples. In 2008, the U.S. Congress passed legislation which former President Barack Obama signed designating the Friday following Thanksgiving each year as Native American Heritage Day in which Native peoples contributing to political, cultural, and economic life of the United States are respected and celebrated. We commemorate Native peoples' continued persistence for social justice and land recognition during National Native American Heritage Month. We continue to recognize the history, achievements, and activism throughout Maryland and the United States history and Montgomery County Public Schools social studies curricula, recognizing the importance of Native communities, both past and present, in shaping American society, and prioritizes elevating Native perspectives, resistance to displacement, and resilience in the face of cultural genocide. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools hereby declare the month of November 2022 
to be observed as Native American Heritage Month in Montgomery County Public Schools. And be it further resolved that Friday, November 25th, 2022, be observed as Native American Heritage Day. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. <coughs> that is unanimous of those here. Thank you. I just, um, <coughs> I asked Dr. McKnight if I could say something <coughs> about uh, Native Americans. Uh, Indigenous Day, we just passed that, you know, it was Columbus Day and Indigenous Day, but it is a way of recognizing some of the concerns that American Indians have. I am wearing today, I will stand up. I'm wearing a ribbon shirt today. The ribbon shirt can be worn by anyone, and it's not part of regalia usually, uh, but if you went to a powwow and they had intertribal dancing, you could use this to do that, or you could just wear your regular clothes, but it's used only for that. The reason they have these is that the colonists wanted the American Indians to wear cloth clothing and they insisted on it. So they are wearing cloth clothing, but they are decorating it the way they want to with their colors for uh, different nations. So this is Nanticokes who are part of Maryland too, uh, not in the Washington area, but uh, many of you who go to Ocean City cross Nanticoke River. And uh, these are native peoples who uh, work on the water. So lots of the uh, regalia is purple because of the inside of the shells uh, that where they do their waterworks. But thank you for giving me that moment. Thank you, thank you Dr. Daka. <clears throat> Our next recognition is National School Psychology Week. The National Association of School Psychologists has designate, designated November 7th through the 11th, 2022 as National School Psychology Week to recognize the important work of school psychologists to support students' learning and well-being. The theme for this year's National School Psychology Week is Together We Shine. The theme is derived from how we hope after several challenging years, we are moving forward. We all have faced difficulties created by the pandemic, social injustice and inequity, economic stress, and challenges to mental and physical health. This week and every week, we encourage school psychologists and school staff to promote positive change in all areas of leadership, in the counseling office, in the classroom, the community, and beyond. School psychologists can focus on improving school climate, identifying system level change, advocating for equity, inclusion, and social justice. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools hereby proclaim November 7th through the 11th, 2022, as National School Psychology Week in Montgomery County Public Schools and recommend observance by all of our school communities. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous, thank you. Thank you. And our final recognition is recognition of National Principals Month. October is National Principals Month designated to recognize the essential role principals play in ensuring that students have access to high quality, rigorous instruction and programming. The principals and assistant principals in Montgomery County Public Schools are the instructional leaders in their buildings, leading culture, systems, and by working tirelessly each day as visionaries, assessment experts, community builders, public relations experts, budget analysts, facility managers, special program administrators, and guardians of various legal, contractual, and policy mandates and initiatives. Principals and assistant principals work collaboratively with families, teachers, and other MCPS staff to develop school improvement plans designed to achieve educational excellence in a safe and inclusive environment and maintain high standards and expectations for all students. We honor and recognize the contribution of all school principals and assistant principals to the success of each student in Montgomery County Public Schools, our most valuable resource and promote awareness of the importance of school leadership in ensuring that every student has access to a high quality education. And therefore be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools hereby proclaim October 2022 as National Principals Month in Montgomery County Public Schools. Move approval. Second. <coughs> All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous, thank you. We're now up to item four. Item four is public comments. <coughs> Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time 
on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have five people signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking and push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have two audio testimonies and eight video testimony presentations. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with the other materials for this meeting. At this time, I'll call to the table Camilla Rankin, Laura Stewart, and Fabio Garay. You may begin speaking in the order you were called. Thank you. Yes, press the button. All right, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Camilla Rankin, and I'm a nationally certified school psychologist in MCPS, speaking today on behalf of Montgomery County Education Association. We are pleased that MCPS will be honoring National School Psychology Week on uh, November 7th through the 11th, but as you are aware, the challenges our school psychologists face in assisting our students require more than one week of celebration and attention. MCA, MCEA is hopeful that this year's theme, Together We Shine, will inspire MCPS to work with MCEA at the negotiations table this year to address the ongoing staffing shortages for school psychologists. Currently, students are facing more social and emotional challenges than ever due to the ongoing effects of COVID, economic uncertainty, and the lack of equitable opportunities. We school psychologists are on the front lines to help our students overcome these challenges and thrive, both personally and academically. However, as recently as last week, there were 38 unfilled school psychologist positions in MCPS. Those of I'm sorry, those in this line of work are experiencing crushing caseloads that are far above recommended levels. All of us are providing coverage at schools that lack a dedicated school psychologist, which leads to inadequate time for case management and supporting our school teams. The school psychologist to student ratio in MCPS is currently one to 1400, which is almost three times as high as the National Association of School Psychologists recommended ratio of one school psychologist to, to 500 students. There are currently six MCPS schools without a dedicated psychologist and those that have assigned psychologists may only have them in the building once or twice a week. MCEA calls on you to build a contract can I finish my last sentence? Just a sentence. Yes, ma'am. I don't know how to make that stop. Thank you. 
Thank you. MCA calls on you to build a contract with us that will lead us to full staffing of every school's psychological services offices. It's time to reinvest in our school psychologists for our students' well-being. Thank you. Hello, my name is Laura Stewart, an MCPTA advocate. I want to applaud MCPS for last year's productive collaboration between Seth Adams, Zinzerate, and the Health and Wellness Committee. We would like to continue that partnership and ask that we again schedule regular meetings. There are several items we'd like to continue to work on, including public data sharing for the IAQ monitoring project, including CO2, particle matter, humidity, temperature, and continued work also on water filtration, including a maintenance plan update. We would like to open a discussion about our artificial turf fields. Several are ending their lifespan. According to the last hardness data, Wooten and Gaithersburg High School had unacceptable levels of hardness. The highest GMAX measured at 199 and 185. A value greater than 200 could cause life-threatening head injuries. And the NFL and Synthetic Turf Council mandate states no fields have a GMAX score above 165. We ask for a status on either repairing or replacing those particular fields. As an Einstein parent, I feel the need to follow up on the continued learning loss in three math classes. We ask for immediate relief. The long-term subs are as helpful as possible, but we have heard that students continue to fall behind in their Algebra II and pre-calculus class. The cluster coordinator and I will be sending an email today to schedule a meeting with Dr. Moran so that we can talk through the options. Einstein students need to continue a college-bound math track, especially for those in STEM. We appreciate any support from the BOE or central office. Lastly, please repair the notification system when a bus route is canceled. Every week I hear about a canceled route, but there's no notification. This continues to disrupt our children's education. So if anything you can take away, that's the big one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Garay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fabio Garay. I'm speaking here on behalf of the Dream Alliance Club at Montgomery College and all undocumented students in the county. So basically, with the Dream, uh, with the Dream Alliance Club, uh, we want the BOE to focus on the Dream, Maryland Dream Act. That is a law that was passed 10 years ago for undocumented students to get in-state tuition. And NCPA doesn't have any information about the Dream Act on their website. Only Montgomery College has this information. Me, myself, as a undocumented student, didn't know about this law until I got to Montgomery College. I graduated in 2019 from Albert Einstein, and <clears throat> neither of my counselor or my mentor didn't teach me about the Dream Act. So I was getting charged out of state tuition, even though I was a resident of the Montgomery County and resident of the Maryland State. So we believe that the Dream Act information is very is essential for Montgomery County. So because Montgomery NCPS is all <coughs> is all in to ensure success for all the students. I'm a NCPS student, and I believe like NCPS has like potential, and the Dream Act needs to be on the website on the NCPS website, so students are aware of that information and they can get higher education. And because of this, many undocumented students doesn't like pursue higher education. So that's what we want. If the BOAE can like post some information about the Dream Map on their website. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'll call Heather Yonick, Yohaniak, and Ellis Angela Vosen Fidalgo. Go ahead. Hello, you're my There we go. 
Uh, greetings, my name is Heather Johannik. I'm a learning and achievement specialist in the Office of School Support and Improvement, and I'm also a parent in the Gaithersburg cluster. Um, I'm grateful for this chance to correct the record, as it was stated at your last meeting that staff development teachers have not had training in anti-racism. Fortunately, this is not true. Um, starting in the summer of 2020, we decided to completely revamp our trainings to put anti-racism at the forefront. Uh, we embraced the work of Tema Oaken and Kenneth Jones, their concept of white supremacy culture, um, or the unspoken characteristics of organizations that normalize whiteness and undermine anti-racist efforts. We introduced these characteristics to SDTs and invited them to reflect on how they show up for them personally and professionally. As we taught our newest SDTs the skills of coaching, facilitation, meeting agenda planning, school improvement, and building relational trust, we interrogated how our normal time-tested ways of doing business in MCPS may actually champion white supremacy or a dominant culture. SDTs embrace the concept of street data to center the experiences of those who matter most, families, students, and educators, and use it to guide school improvement. They also studied with Alex Vanette, the author of Equity Center Trauma-Informed Education. We've been using her policy review tool in combination with the evidence of equity questions to lead review of school policies to determine if they are anti-racist and trauma-informed. SDTs have literally changed the MCPS vernacular because of their anti-racism learning, as it is now common to hear other leaders discussing white supremacy culture, street data, and equity center trauma-informed ed. Thankfully, you and our superintendent, once an SDT herself, have restored the SDT position to a full-time allocation and reinvested in supporting these teacher leaders through ongoing professional learning. We could not be more grateful for your support in restoring this position because we believe everybody can learn and grow. And we look forward to future collaboration around anti-racist learning. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have two audio testimonies. First up is Miriam Shaik. Please play the audio. Good afternoon to President Wolf, Superintendent McKnight, and members of the board. My name is Miriam Shake, and I'm a junior at Blake High School. I'm testifying today to discuss the rigidity of the courses able to fulfill the requirement of four English credits. The pathway for English in high school is fairly simple. English 9 through English 12 with only variations for honors courses or AP language for English 11 and AP literature for English 12. Aside from the small variety, there is little to no room for exploration in English-related courses. In my sophomore year, I took Honors English 10 as well as AP Seminar. Although Honors English gave us a basic foundation of how to do things like find an argument and give correct evidence, AP Seminar did all of this and much more. We learned how to create a compelling, multi-layered argument, defend it, find sources that both support and go against the argument, and defend them both. While the standard English course provides a good foundation, AP Seminar is much more rigorous and independent and provides skills that many high schoolers do not develop until college. Similarly, this year I'm in AP Lang, where the main focus of the class is writing essays. Also, I'm in AP Research, where the largest assignment of the class is a research paper due at the end of the year. Again, all skills I am learning in AP Lang are being translated to research, while also del delving even deeper, with conducting our own studies and looking at others' research, analyzing evidence, and applying context and perspective to our findings. Having to take one class for required credit and another class only counting as an elective takes up space on my schedule and restricts me from taking other electives that I am more interested in. I'm not the only one in this situation with countless other classmates having taken both research and seminar. But this issue is not confined only to these classes. For example, journalism students learn to gather news as well as edit, which are all things covered in standard English classes. Once again, students are forced to give up space on their schedules just to repeatedly cover the same topics throughout the year. We need to let our students choose their own desired learning path and give them the space to do that without extra stress and school time wasted. Thank you for your time. Next is Inuke Weta Singh Singa. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. My name is Nuki Wetasenghe and I'm a 12th grader at Northwest High School. I'm an advocate for women's rights involved in student-led advocacy groups, including MoCo Empower and MoCo for Change. Throughout my MCPS high school career, I found that our school curriculum did not include a proper gender studies discussion. Last year, I did a research project where I looked at the discrepancies between gender equity, gender equality, and women's empowerment. Through that research, I found that students in our county did not understand those topics. Some simply did not care, but others wanted to know more, but did not have the proper resources to do so. The best way, in my opinion, to teach students these concepts is through curriculum development. 
We could provide students with a gender studies elective course or incorporate these topics into existing classes such as English and history. English classes should promote book lists with books that challenge stereotypical gender norms and books that have feminist discussions. We should be required to read such books. Books such as Feminist Theory from Margin to Center and Feminism is for Everybody by Bell Hooks would be excellent starting points. History classes should teach students about the different waves of feminism, the real stories of slavery and segregation in America that include female accounts and how to grapple with the consequences of racialized intergenerational trauma. Now, I realize that the word feminism is considered a trigger word for most people. I think a reason for that is because most people do not know the true definition of the word feminism. That is yet another reason to promote feminist works and discussions in schools. Our population is about 50% women, and if we don't amplify women's voices, we are not empowering them. Therefore, we are losing 50% of our potential. If we don't include female and queer voices into our curriculums, then we don't get the opportunity to see the whole story. I ask that you develop curriculums that amplify marginalized voices as well as incorporate discussions on the fluidity of gender. Thank you. We have eight video testimonies. First up is the video. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher McDonald. I'm a student at Longview School in Germantown, Maryland. I am a senior and will be graduating at the end of the school year. I want to thank everyone for being here today and allowing me to represent AAC users. I would like to thank the Board of Education for recognizing AAC Awareness Month and allowing me to speak today. AAC, or Augmentative and Alternative Communication, is used by people who can rely on their verbal speech. AAC incorporates the individual's full communication abilities and might include vocalizations, gestures, eye gaze, body movements, and aided communication. AAC is multimodal and allows each individual to use all modes of communication. At Longview School, we use AAC to communicate and advocate as independently as possible. Our mission at Longview is to work as a team focused on students' individual growth and to support independence and quality of life. AAC helps me do that. I am fortunate to have a family that not only supports AAC use at school, but at home as well. I use two switches that are attached to modular hoses with two speech generating devices that give me the opportunity to access my words through using my temples. With my AAC system, I'm able to join the Thanksgiving table with my family and join the conversation and jokes. At school, I use AAC in lessons and communicate with my peers. AAC has given me the opportunity to advocate for myself when I need a position change in my wheelchair or need a break. My teachers help me when I communicate that I want something. They can joke with me, laugh with me, and I can do the same. AAC allows me to be heard. As I prepare to graduate, I can say that because of AAC, there is no limit on what I can accomplish. Because of my family's support, there is no limit to what I can accomplish. Because of my school and teachers, I, Christopher McDonald, will do great things. I would like to thank you for allowing me to represent AAC users here today. I hope I will be able to help everyone understand that AAC can do, why it is important, and the door it can open for children, students, and adults like me. Next is Sophie Nijin. Please play. Good the video. afternoon, members of the Board of Education, and Dr. McKnight. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sophie Nijin, and I'm a sophomore at Rockville High School. I will be testifying on how our current graduation requirements deter students from pursuing career and technical education programs. I'm in the Project Lead the Way Biomedical Science program at my school, where we participate in hands-on experiments and explore a variety of healthcare career options. Although this four-year program does count as an elective credit, I find myself not having enough time to satisfy my other graduation requirements, like technology or health. Thus, I have to take classes over the summer to fulfill them, meaning I do not have space in my schedule for the classes that I want to take or the ones that would align with my future career. This situation is a lot more common than you think. Thousands of students are enrolled in some of the best career readiness programs in the nation, ranging from cosmetology to the Academy of Finance, yet they still face the issue of potentially not being able to graduate on time. 
In terms of scheduling our courses when the school year approaches, there is not enough flexibility with what we want to take. Many of the requirements are barriers to graduation or just classes that we simply tick off a checklist once we're finished with them. Students should not have to sacrifice the courses that are meaningful to them. We often talk about the importance of career readiness, yet students face obstacles when trying to choose the classes that are truly going to help them in the future. There are several CTE programs that take up three classes of a student's schedule. That is why it is important for MCPS to consider how students can complete their graduation requirements and take courses that they're interested in since CTE programs are so time consuming. Members of the board, it is imperative that we look into credit exemptions or let the CTE programs satisfy many of the graduation requirements MCPS and MSDE mandate so that students are able to follow their career pathways to the furthest degree. Thank you for your time. Next is Praneels Suvrana. Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. I am Pranil Suvarna, a sophomore at Clarksburg High School. Many opportunities for students in MCPS are being wasted. Students are forced to follow arcane graduation requirements that serve no tangible purpose. A four-year math requirement is one example of this. Many MCPS students are left completing many years of math that they don't need due to this outdated graduation requirement. Students who are placed in Algebra 1 in their 7th grade year are forced to take advanced math courses in high school at the expense of their well-being and electives. The irony of this requirement is further highlighted in the fact that if a student were able to graduate one year early, this ma four-year math requirement is waived. While I understand that this is a state requirement, I am asking for you to advocate for student voices and speak on behalf of your constituents, the, stu the students, in order to change this. Even if students take two math classes in a school year, they still need to take a math course every year of their high school career in order to fulfill this requirement. Evidently, this is problematic because students are undeniably forced to take harder and harder math classes every year. The original idea of this requirement, which was to make sure that Maryland students were receiving the math knowledge needed to be successful in college, does not make sense either. Students who are finishing their math credits early are more than likely to have the math skills needed to be successful in the future, and forcing them to take more math at a high school level does not make sense. I'm asking you to support your constituents, your students, and advocate against the policies that MSD mandates which create barriers to an equitable education for students. Thank you for your time. Next is Jillian Pereno. Good afternoon to the members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Jillian Prano and I'm a sophomore at Springbrook High School. Today I will be discussing MCPS's CTE programs and the issues students face due to the required course credits. I was a former CTE student and I was given the opportunity and took advantage of MCPS's Health Professions program at Paint Branch High School. The most pressing issue I had while I was in the program was accruing enough credits to graduate on time. My pathway took up a class period and if I were to continue it until junior year, it would have three to four credit earning courses taken off of my schedule. As you know, MCPS requires a full year of fine arts, PE, health, and technology education. And because of this, students in the program have to participate in summer school to take the same electives any other student is entitled to. I myself had to take two summer classes in order to satisfy some of my credits. The issue extends past me as I see many students in the same program struggling with the same issue. If CTEs are given as an opportunity to help students succeed, especially at a collegiate level, why must we choose between graduating on time and being a part of a program that is meant to help us succeed? Yet, a solution exists. For example, the Medical Pathway CTE can count as an NGSS credit if MCPS only slightly alters the CTE curriculum to fit the NGSS standards for classes such as Biology. This could provide students a chance to not only take advantage of the pathway, but also satisfy one of their course credits. Furthermore, middle schools can promote or offer more electives that count as high school credit. If middle schools offer more high school level courses such as art, many students who want to participate in CTE pathways would have an equitable chance to do so. Evidently, there are countless different solutions for moving the arcane barriers for students in CTE programs. I call on the Board of Education to hear concerns and advocate to resolve this pre-existing problem that burdens too many of MCPS's students. With solving this issue, students can move forward without the worries of graduating on time and still participate participate in a CT pathway that undoubtedly will aid them in the future. Thank you for your time. Next is Ribera Dosho. Hi, hello there, Dr. McKnight and all board members. My name is Ribera Dosho and I live in the Silver Spring area and attend Montgomery Blair High School as a sophomore. Go Blazers. I'd like to bring up a question that would further explain the scenario in which I'm speaking about. If you were to give a piece of homework with a bonus question at the end, 
how many people do you think would return that piece of homework with the bonus question done? Not many, but the few that do, you know are exceptional students who care and took the time to challenge themselves. And those students are the same students who take courses like journalism and all these other extracurricular classes that further develop certain ideas you learned in your core classes. Now, since the sixth grade, when I started walking, watching documentaries about civil wars across the globe, I knew I wanted to take journalism. And with our renowned Silver Tips newspaper, many others did as well. What we weren't prepared for was journalism not being a credit. Even though we write countless drafts, analyze countless articles, and read different sources, and learn how to cite sources thoroughly and clearly, this wasn't a credit. Which leads to students like me taking three hours of English every other day. This can make you feel like you're making the wrong decision and that you should take another course that gives you that credit requirement for graduation. This makes you not look forward to going into a career path in journalism or tech. And I really hope that we can reconsider the certain electives that we think are English credits. With the amount of work that we put into these electives and the course load that was put on, I think that students deserve the ability to feel comfortable when taking on this rigorous course load. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Next is Nikita Bot. Good afternoon to members of the board. My name is Nikita Bot, and I'm a sophomore at Montgomery Blair High School. I am testifying today to discuss the need for a half credit financial literacy graduation requirement in MCPS. Financial literacy is an integral part of growing into adulthood and it would be incredibly beneficial to have financial literacy courses required for students to take. Financial literacy is a growing problem. 43% of adults in the U.S. are financially illiterate, states Forbes, leaving that 43% of people having difficulties managing their finances. Schools are in a great place to help solve this problem as they can help students learn more about financial literacy in their teenage years so they are well prepared for adulthood and its financial responsibilities. Financial literacy education in high school has several positive effects on students' futures. It will prepare them for life after high school by teaching them about credit scores, taxes, and anything else pertinent to one's finances. It can also help reduce inequity by teaching students how to make wise financial decisions to set them up for success. It also makes students more confident about life after high school by teaching them the tools to create healthy finances. As a student myself, I often worry about how I will make financial decisions in the future. Currently, there are minimal options my school offers to learn more about financial literacy and my peers in other schools can say the same. If my school offered a financial literacy requirement, my peers and I would benefit tremendously. Fortunately, financial literacy education has already been rolled out in other states. Florida, Ohio, and Rhode Island, in addition to five other states, all have financial literacy requirements. They have been seeing tangible benefits in student preparedness after high school because of this requirement. MCPS should follow their example and create a financial literacy requirement to help students' futures. After all, schools are supposed to prepare us for the future, and financial literacy is a big part of that. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to testify, and I urge you to consider my request. Next is Fabian Germa. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. My name is Fabian Germa and I'm a senior at Thomas S. Wooten High School. Today, I am advocating for the creation of a half credit financial literacy requirement. Last year, a financial literacy requirement failed. However, I implore the board to reconsider this fundamental requirement due to its overwhelming benefit to students' college and career readiness. As a senior, I am in the midst of college applications, forcing me to think about how I am going to finance my education. The rising cost of higher education forces students to take out loans that for many take years to pay back. Thus, these loans leave many students in thousands of dollars in debt. These impacts are more serious amongst lower income students who must take out even more loans to cover the cost of higher education. With the current MCPS graduation requirements, students like myself are not taught the necessary skills to avoid debt like this. A financial literacy requirement would begin to teach students how to seek out aid and other opportunities for a reduced tuition. In addition to college finances, teaching students how to build a budget, retain a good credit score, and save money are all essential skills not covered within the MCPS high school curriculum. 
Leaving students with the responsibility to grasp these topics on their own creates disparities within our school system. Students with financially literate parents and guardians are often exposed to these topics throughout their formative years. However, students without financially literate parents and guardians are forced to understand these topics without the guidance of an experienced individual. If a requirement is implemented, all students, no matter who they are, will learn about these critical subjects before graduation. A financial literacy requirement is necessary in today's world where irresponsible spending patterns are common amongst younger people. As a student and as a constituent of the school system, I implore you to make a half credit financial literacy requirement for all high school students. I thank you so much for your time. Our final video comes from Kimberly Glassman. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. My name is Kim Glassman. I testified on September 22nd about the response to the shooting at Magruder. MCPS called senior officials to the table to dispel the myth that our community lacks engagement. Dr. Joftis asked, if MCPS has done all of this, how are our two more involved parents here today? Allow me to explain. There was a meeting on January 22nd, a webinar. Parents were not able to speak. Questions were limited to a chat box. MCPS decided what to answer. They said there would be additional opportunities for Q&A. Dr. McKnight said, I pledge to learn every single detail of what we can do to make our school safer. MCPS said we would have open and honest discussions. This has yet to occur. There was a meeting on March 16th, a PTSA meeting. MCPS presented on well-being and restorative justice, not the incident. As a local president for four of the last five years, I can tell you that despite our efforts, these are not high attendance events. Our first meeting this year had about 16 parents. There was a meeting on April 28th, a focus group about safety by invitation. I was there with eight to 10 parents, one from the Algebra II class who had many questions. There were no answers. There was a meeting on June 30th to discuss the after action report by invitation. I was there with eight other parents. This was the first opportunity for select parents from that class to share details. There were many questions and no answers. There was no follow-up until September 28th. MCPS letter sent letters to parents from the Algebra II class stating lockdown procedures were followed despite what we know students told parents. MCPS has yet to address the conflict between what parents were told and what MCPS concluded. MCPS is not taking this opportunity to learn and improve before the next emergency. Please look at your responses to BCC and our community. At BCC, MCPS's lack of communication led to a frightening spread of rumors, fear throughout the community. Within weeks, there was a meeting, the opportunity to ask questions for MCPS to respond in real time. There was a shooting in our school, an hours long lockdown, limited communication and a questionable AAR. It has been nine months. We are waiting for the promised open and honest discussion. Is our community less worthy? Is that a decision grounded in equity? This will conclude our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is Thursday, November the 10th, 2022. Sign-ups will open the evening of Thursday, November the 3rd. In addition to the online sign-ups for public comment, we have returned to the practice of in-person same-day sign-ups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person signups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when all slots are filled. At this time, I'll take comments from my fellow board members. If you have a comment, please turn your light on. Ms. Mandrowski? Yeah, thank you. I want to thank everybody for their testimonies. Um, I just I had a couple of questions. Um, I really appreciated the um, request for the DREAM Act information being put on our, our website. I, hopefully that's an easy um, fix. Um, I know we've had conversations about the situation with the math classes, and I didn't know if you wanted to speak to that at all um, at Einstein. And, um, and then just the the conversation about the graduation requirements. Um, I appreciated that a lot of the students recognize that they're state mandated, but um, I happen to agree with them on why a class like journalism couldn't be an English class or something of those sorts, especially for our career pathway students who end up feeling like they have to sacrifice things. If you could just speak to some of that. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I first want to say uh, what great coordinated student advocacy today. Um, it was simply amazing. I was sitting here writing notes 
um, looking forward to, as a superintendent, I do have an opportunity to go forward to our state board often and share the real, share the real experiences of uh, how we need to make real life change. So I look forward to actually going and sharing some of the testimony of our students. That just makes it all more real um, when I have an opportunity to testify to the state board. And I will say to our students, it's a, a great opportunity because with implementation of much of the blueprint requirements, defining college career readiness, much of this overlaps with an opportunity for us to be able to look at the courses that students are able to take and um, how that then addresses graduation requirements. So it's a kind of a natural uh, opportunity for us to look at all of those things. As it relates to financial, um, so we will do that. But as it relates to financial literacy, remember we have not ruled out the possibility of making that a requirement. I want to come back and say that again. We wanted to make sure we looked um, very carefully at this to make sure that we were not um, putting any students at risk of meeting the graduation requirements. And that was very important to us in looking at some of our data and seeing how some of our students um, were impacted by that. And we would not want them to be negatively impacted. So. Um, Let's remember that and remember that's coming back this year because, again, I want to say it is not ruled out the possibility of us um, eventually possibly getting to financial literacy as a requirement. Um, so that's what I'll say about coursework. Stay tuned. Um, many of the students I'm going to invite back, I know Dr. Pugh um, was listening intently to the testimony as well. We'll include them on some of our um, planning moving forward for the blueprint um, curriculum. I mean, they, they share great examples. And those are the, those are the exact examples that we need to showcase uh, to the state. In terms of um, Einstein, I know we were working specifically with Albert Einstein High School mm -hmm. to address the needs. Um, I believe I last understood there was one math vacancy. If I am wrong, uh, Dr. Marks, if you are here, please come down and correct me. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we were working with that school specifically to look at what um, supports they needed so that the students were getting what they needed. And, and in cases in which we needed to use a long-term substitute to address um, vacancies that we were supporting them so that our students would still get what they need. So I appreciate that and I just want to um, reinforce to our community, any of our schools that have vacancies, we've not forgotten about them. We are still working with those schools hand in hand, still recruiting. We have December graduates that are coming up and I know December now here at the end of October seems like a long time away, but we do have faith in a lot of the programs that we've put in place to be able to support our substitutes who are in the schools right now so that's, that our students are still getting what they need. Dr. Yes. Marks? Hi. Uh, yes, we're uh, still targeting, uh, particularly targeting for Einstein. Uh, we are looking at our December grads. We're having a, um, a, a reception with our student teachers on November 16th. We are working with them, looking at um, if we can hire them as early as we can. And uh, we also are um, looking at our substitutes and trying to get people who have some math background and to try to um, match them with Einstein. Um, and Dr. Marks, again, I, I wasn't sure. Did you know of the specific vacancy at Einstein for math? Well, there, there is four. a long-term sub yes. in the math. There is a long-term sub in the math department there. You mentioned how, how are they being supported? Right, and do we yes. ever move people around to fill in so one school isn't missing four teachers and another school has all of theirs, or is that not something well, we can I, do? I know that um, uh, Einstein is providing a lot of support for that class in terms of their resource teacher and the other math teachers in that, in uh, at the school as well. Okay, my, uh, just as a follow-up question before I ask my last question is, do we charge for summer school if a student needs a class specifically because they're missing it due to something like a career pathway requirements and or something like, anything like that? Well, we've pretty much moved away from students being charged unless it is something that they elect to take, okay. um, you know, uh, to 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 advance that. So that's okay. something that we'll have to look into and scrub the data to look at that more specifically over time. Okay, I thought um, we had, but I just yeah. wanted to make sure that kids weren't having to pay if they had to. Um, and and then, if you just yeah. just to say you remember the last yes. couple of years, particularly after COVID-19, we were able to use our ESSA funds specifically for that purpose to make sure that we were not putting our students at any disadvantage for summer school opportunities. Right. Now, of course, a part of the conversation is going to be, and sure. I said we can go back and look at the data mm -hmm. to see over time, before the last few years, what that looked like 
uh, within the system because we will need to make some decisions moving forward about what some of those priorities are. And I do will, I will say that over the past couple of years, our summer school program has grown exponentially um, as we would have expected um, as a result of COVID-19. And so we do want to make sure that, that any finances does not become a barrier as we see more and more students and families making a decision to, quite frankly, extend their school year for support. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. The last question is actually for Dr. Murphy, and it's just um, in reference to the Magruder testimony. I mean, it's something obviously we are all aware we've heard over and over again. A few weeks ago, we'd asked about your timeline in terms of addressing this, which was a request of their um, parent groups. Do you want to speak to that at all and to where you are and how it's going? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'd like to update the board and the community that there have been a number of things that we've already begun. And I would also just say that we have learned from each one of these unfortunate circumstances in our schools. I, I will, you know, highlight that leadership is situational. So while um, I know the advocacy of the parents, each situation is going to be a little bit different depending on the set of circumstances and how we respond. And I just want us all to keep that in mind. I think we have learned, and from my uh, you know, experience and knowledge in dealing with these two issues, we have learned certain things from these situations. And actually, families, staff are beginning to see those. One of the things that we um, kicked off about several weeks ago is we provided an update across the entire district with some of our safety protocols so that everyone has a clear understanding. We also did that with staff and we are communicating that with parents, and that is going to follow up with uh, PTA meetings or organizational meetings in the schools in November. So that's one piece of that. I understand completely the advocacy uh, that many parents from Magruder are expressing, and I'm well aware of that. We have begun individual parent meetings with um, those students that were in the Algebra II class. We're almost through all those uh, parents that have requested meetings and then I think at that point I'll be prepared to talk about what the next steps will be and how we will engage in the community. I think one of the things that I'm hearing very clearly from the community is they want the facts, they want the truth, Correct. and they yes. want us to be transparent and that's by the way what I intend to deliver. I appreciate that. And they want, I think they want an in-person, face-to-face uh, Oh, ab absolutely. To talk, I, as a community. I understand that, but I, I also think that, as I stated in the beginning, yeah. this is a situational situation. So there are a variety of different sensitivities uh, across a, a continuum, and I think we need to be sensitive to those situations. Uh, I, Please be patient. Please be understanding. Um, no, I'm speaking to the Magruder community. I know you're patient and understanding. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I understand the timeline here, but um, we are on it and we will continue to address it. Thank you. Can, can I ask a follow up to um, Ms. Mandrowski, Dr. Murphy? Sure. Um, I, I know that emotions run high in these kind of situations. Mm -hmm. and expectations are, are different on all sides, mm -hmm. but I was kind of trying to figure out, are, do we have an actual protocol that we're putting in place so that families will know what to expect? I know that that's one of the things we talked about. Sure, so that, that goes back to my um, comments a little bit earlier about what we've rolled out here in the last several weeks. Um, I think families, what I have learned, may not completely understand when we're communicating to them about a lockdown, uh, shelter in place, and then what does that exactly mean, what does that exactly look like, and what is supposed to be happening while those things transpire. The other thing we very clearly heard from our community is we want to know what's going on, so how are you communicating with me? So the other piece of this is we want to put protocols into place that we want to be informing parents or updating them about the situation. We can't give you all the details, but we can kind of tell you how things are progressing. And part of this is also working with our law enforcement partners in Montgomery County as well. So there are many pieces to this. We're trying to you know, get these pieces fashioned together, and I think part of it is consistency, recognizing that each situation is going to be a little bit different. So you're, what you're saying is that we're still putting together an actual protocol based on your conversations at the different schools and the different situations? No, or? no, I'm sorry if I communicated. It, 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 that, those protocols are coming out. There is okay. a letter going to okay. be coming out to parents either okay. later this week um, or the first part of next week. All right. Thank you very much. 
Ms. Silvestri. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to just to say thank you to Dr. McKnight for your willingness to speak uh, before the board, uh, the state, around mm -hmm. some of the concerns that we heard from our students in terms of as the state requirements are changing for graduation, mm -hmm. it's really important that they hear these uh, real-world experiences. We're promoting CTE. We want them right. to do it, but work with us here right. so that that can um, be successful for them. Could you um, expand on the testimony? And I, I wasn't fully aware about bus notification malfunctions. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to that so that I can better understand what's being done to address that? Yes, um, I, I will say a few words and then I will actually turn it over to Mr. Hall um, as he's been working with his department diligently on that. So actually this past week, I believe it was, in which we actually put out a communication and we put it, I believe it's in our things to know email, where uh, we had a system that was established so that we could notify parents. We recognize this, um, that parents wanted early notification and to be made aware. So we uh, put on our website exactly how they would be notified so that parents would have the process um, in front of them and understand if notification was to occur, how they would find out that information earlier if transportation, in fact, was, um, was impacted. But most importantly, um, I want to say I want to commend our transportation team. I understand that many of them were. Um, you know, they, they had a, um, a think tank experience this week really working through some of the challenges which is that as we've said to the board and to the public we have a hand use transportation system in which our employees are coming together day to day and writing out exactly what needs to be done what the transportation needs are and how we uh, fill in those those blanks when we we have an opening or an employee is unable to transport students mm -hmm. um, Literally, before we came into this meeting, we were um, excited because some of our, our, our team got together and were able to consolidate many of our bus routes. So they were able to consolidate 12, 11 of them, which is going to be significant in being able to impact um, us being able to, to provide that transportation. So we're probably going to see, not probably, we will see an immediate change just based on that, them being able to consolidate the routes. So we've, one, already informed our parents about how we would be in touch with them or they would be notified if transportation was being impacted. But I'm going to say because of the work that that team has done around consolidation, that's going to see, um, you're going to see a significant change. And then we also have, um, I think it's about 19 bus drivers who will be coming out soon um, that will also join the ranks of transportation. So we're working on this. I say to our community, you should see some, um, some relief pretty immediate from, from the steps that we've taken um, as recent as today. The, the testimony was about notification failures? Correct. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, because we just, we just put out to the community um, that we, how we were notifying them that, was, that did not exist. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, my final question is about uh, Mr. Garai's testimony around the DREAM Act. And mm -hmm. this has been around for 10 years. Actually, this is the 11th year. And so my question is, um, who's responsible for sharing DREAM Act information with our students? Yeah. Uh, very interesting that you asked that question because as I was listening to his testimony, I kept thinking the same. Where would this information come in? He actually shared, he would have hoped to have hear, heard it from his counselors and those who are providing um, uh, options to, to students beyond graduation of what's needed. So as he was speaking, I, I said it, it definitely will be important for our office under the direction of Damon Monteleone, our counselors and, and others who interact with students around their uh, post-graduation plan to have that information, much like you know what's available for financial aid, but really studying the DREAM Act and, and looking at what, um, what benefits we want to make sure our students are aware of. So that's one. I also saw um, Celia Fisher um, head out with him. There she is head out with him afterwards, because one of his other requests, I think, was a simple and easy fix, which was, can we also make sure this information is available? Already done. Already done. <laughs> See? Very good. Was it that it's available uh, on the website, just for public information generally? And I appreciate him saying that, because it goes beyond just the conversation with the students, but also making sure our, we're putting information out that's important for our families to know and understand so that our students can take advantage of those opportunities. So thank you, team, for taking care of that so swiftly. Um, yeah, and I, I think this is a larger systemic issue that ties to our later conversation about college and career readiness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a, a, a good percentage of our population is affected by this, and if they don't know that this exists, 
That's right. the conversation about going to college ends mm -hmm. there. So um, I hope that we can see this integrated into that larger plan. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to follow up on Ms. Silvestri's comment about the buses. You know, and I, and I have spoken to, um, here comes Dana back. <laughs> I have, I have spoken to her already because I was a little bit concerned that uh, some communities seem to be impacted every week. And I wanted to raise the equity issues around that and how much instructional time certain students seem to be missing and whether or not, as I originally understood it, it was going to alternate, you know, so this week it might be this cluster, another week it might be that cluster. But it looks like it's always the same cluster to me, and I'm very concerned mm -hmm. that a number, particularly of our impacted schools, or students are missing instruction. And so I just want to be sure that whatever system you're developing takes that into consideration, because we've been impacted quite a bit over in the East County, I could say. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. You are exactly correct. And um, as we have dug into this issue, and I think Dr. McKnight put it best, really kind of leave no stone unturned, I think is the best way to put it. We have seen certain parts of our county that have been impacted more so than others. The Northeast is one of those areas. I would say Clarksburg would probably be the second. And what was important to us was that one, we were at least able to make a level of notification to let people know. And two, we did want to look at the component of how we could move the, um, the level of cancellation from school to school or possibly area to area. And initially, we weren't able to do that. So what was within our control was really going back and looking at how many students are on every bus, how many routes we have. And remember, we're looking at all this by hand. And so we did come up with ways in which, especially in those two areas where we are able to consolidate some of our routes um, on our lower filled buses to be able to provide one more drivers um, because we still need drivers please if you are planning on applying to MCPS as a bus driver please continue to do so um, uh, we currently have nine drivers who will start this week who will definitely be of support and the bulk of those drivers will go to our depot that services the northeast part of our county and that's our target right now to make sure that we can continue to populate hiring our substitute drivers into full-time positions and continue to populate them into that part of the county. Also, I think it would help our public to understand why it's not easy just to get bus drivers from somewhere else. Because, you know, a lot of our, our fellow school districts contract out mm -hmm. and there are only so many companies that have bus drivers that have already been cleared mm -hmm. to work with students. So I think if you could talk a minute, just a, sure. minute, just a minute about that, it would help them understand why it's not as easy as, as people seem to think it is. There are two things with bus drivers. Um, one, they have to have a CDL license, specifically not just a CDL, but they have to take a test in order to actually drive a bus. We want our people who are transporting our students to have a level of safety and regulation and to be tested. So that entire process takes approximately four to five weeks. We do all that training here in Montgomery County. We're very fortunate so that we are training people from the very beginning to be with our students and to understand the things and values that are important to us. The second piece is um, in terms of contractors. There are contractors in many of our other LEAs and that's all they use. These are our employees. The component with the contractors is each LEA in um, Maryland is in the same situation as MCPS. However, if we compare ourselves to our counterparts, the first 25 days of school, we were very fortunate where we had no interrupted routes and we were able to put every bus on the road. Now that we're looking at opportunities, when well, our opportunities, that's the wrong word. We're looking at places where we do have interrupted routes. Um, the number of contractors available just are not there. Um, one, the systems that are using them are actually having difficulty finding them. So that doesn't leave an opportunity for us to do that. But currently, we have about 38 future bus drivers in the pipeline. So from the nine I said that would begin driving this week, 
Then we have about 12 early in November and 17 at the end of November that will be able to balance us out um, in terms of what our needs are. And then we'll just continue to hire. We do have three recruitment events that are coming up over the next couple of weeks. One actually on November 1st, another on November 7th that we'll do in tandem where we also need building service workers and on December 1st. So we continue to actively recruit and look for talent. Thank you. I just wanted people to understand that contracting out wasn't really a possibility because they're already contracted mm -hmm. to other school districts. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Joftis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to um, highlight part of um, Ms. Stewart's uh, testimony around the artificial turf fields. Um, we actually have something coming up in a cons consent and consent agenda item that um, I'm going to ask to be pulled so that we can discuss that. I would like us to discuss as a board, and we don't have to have the full conversation now, really trying to cut back on the use of artificial fields. They are, um, there's a lot of evidence that they're more dangerous to kids, they're terrible for the environment, and I think in the spirit of our great work with the buses, um, and a lot of the sustainability work with our buildings that we need to we need to continue and look at the work um, of the uh, replacing the artificial turf fields with with grass fields. I know we're not going to figure this out right now, but I do want to highlight that as a um, as an item that to, for discussion. Thank you, um, Mr. Kim. I think Ms. Harris. Okay. Uh, I first wanted to to underline. Um, from the comment about the SDT training, uh, the importance of street data. And, and as we sit around this table and, and in this room and talk about anti-racism and our work around equity, um, it's, it's just important to keep in mind and center that work around the lived experiences of our students, our staff, and our families who spend time in the classroom and in the community. So um, just wanted to first underline that. Um, and then, yeah, while, while we're having this conversation around graduation requirements, I think what um, the comments from our students here today really highlighted was that when we talk about reducing graduation requirements, it really is more than just a, a thing of convenience or, or saving students time. It, it really boils down to um, allowing them opportunities for college and career readiness and using programming as a way of addressing the inequities that might otherwise exist in our system. Uh, so the importance of this work, I, I think, definitely should be a priority um, you know, to, to, to uh, decision makers around this um, and, and, and should certainly uh, be a priority to us. Uh, for my own understanding, I wanted to ask about, A, what, what we can do around substitution. Um, you know, the example that some of the students brought up was um, those AP English courses uh, being available to um, be accepted as those English requirements. Uh, so. I'm sure many people in this room could answer, but are those decisions also MSDE um, kind of we have to operate in the framework of they let us, they tell us which which can be kind of swapped out? I'm going to ask Dr. Pew to join me for this conversation at the at the table. MSDE's role, roles is basically to outline the number of requirements right. that a student has to meet, um, and there are some specific subjects in which they outline you know, what that subject needs to be. Um, many of our students today were talking about classes that we now classify as electives mm -hmm. and how those classes could then be translated into how this, and it would be, the state viewing them as like an English credit. Mm -hmm. um, so so some of it would be, an, you know, would be us having to advocate to the state why we see value in uh, shifting some of our electives to what the state currently sees as a core course um, in their eyes. And again, I just go back to um, the blueprint does provide um, a, a runway and an opportunity for us to have those conversations. Because I mean, the, the positive part of this is it is, a, it is a chance for us to move public education into a more innovative space. Um, and the nice part about this is, you know, in many interactions with the state, they're seeing how some of their policy quite frankly, um, just gets in the way of that. <laughs> um, and so the evaluation of it has just gone hand in hand. Dr. P, any additions? Sure, thank you. There is a state, a Maryland state program of studies to which we have to align all of our courses to. So the state has 
what the course number is, what the credit is worth, and the content of that course. So our supervisors have to go through and do a match to say this course meets the same standards, it would be equitable. So there is a process by which to make sure that they're meeting the same standards. The difference in English 9, 10, and journalism, they're pretty vast because journalism is heavily focused on on the written piece, but that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities to innovate and try to do some additional courses that actually count for those core four English courses um, that all students take. For example, the AP courses can at times correlate to what 11 and 12 would. So I'm happy to continue to work with the state. Thank you. Uh, and then Dr. McKnight, you mentioned um, ongoing efforts to look into the impacts of having a financial literacy requirement. Yep. Uh, again, from my understanding, I'd like to, to kind of hear both what that would look like and the status of that. I think that is an important consideration. Mm -hmm. So at our board meeting in the spring, uh, when we brought forward the presentation, we asked, uh, or what we said was it was best at that point for us to make that financial literacy component a continued elective for students. So that means any student who has the flexibility in their schedule to be able to take that, they can continue to take it. And we were actually looking or, or made some secessions to things that could be substituted to make it more available for students to take it as an elective. But we also agreed that we would be coming back this year um, after we had done more study around the impact of making it a requirement for students so that we could bring the data forward and be able to say if we were to make this as a requirement from what we see right now in our graduation rates and who's meeting what, here is a group that we would identify that would um, be vulnerable based on the current state requirement. So that was, that was where we left it and, and that's why we agreed to return back to that conversation this year. Thank you. I think we also said we wanted to look at our some of the neighboring districts yes. yeah. that Thank you. were yeah, doing that this year and seeing what implications That's they right. had. Um, and it, my understanding was we weren't quite ready to launch financial literacy as a requirement this year just in terms of curriculum and teacher mm -hmm. capacity. And right. so we wanted to give some time for the system to catch up to that. That is exactly correct, Dr. Joftis. Thank There's you. There's a resolution. Um, and then lastly, I think that this piece around communicating um, around bus routes is just a great example of the general need to streamline these kind of more time-sensitive communications. Like we're not talking about uh, weeks in advance, but really the morning of or the day of or in the moment. I think across the board, that's an area um, of great importance. Um, and then my understanding is that there was, again, ongoing efforts around looking at all the different communication platforms that community members, parents, students currently use. I believe there was around seven or eight, um, and that there was efforts to look into how that can be streamlined. I think that's a great avenue to take. Um, so I just wanted to ask about, again, the status of that. Ms. Sharon? Good afternoon and thank you for that question. Um, we're actually, we were just speaking about this earlier and we're really excited about this work. So currently we have a cross office team that has gotten together last week. Um, with this cross office team, they have um, done a bunch of demos, contacted a bunch of vendors to look at a variety of uh, demos for a basically a, a communication tool that will provide translation, that will be um, effective in two-way communication, will be prompt, and is something that can be used not only by the district, but by teachers in the classroom. Um, as Mr. Kim noted, we have a lot of platforms, some platforms vary from school to school. You go to one school, we're using this, we're using this, one teacher's using this, one teacher's using that. So the purpose of this work group is to really say, okay, how can we synthesize all of this so we're using a common structure that's gonna meet all of our needs? So currently the work group is narrowing down um, the options. They're gonna be bringing the options that they narrow down to a variety of focus groups uh, with both external stakeholders and internal stakeholders to make sure that we're making the right choice. And we estimate that by the end of November we will be able to have something that is gonna, that, that we've identified and then it goes into the communication and the process of actually deploying it. So we're really excited about those efforts. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, first question I had, and I, I, I apologize. I, it, 
I forgot to write down her name, the very first um, school psychologist who testified. And it made me uh, wonder if, uh, and Mr. Kim brought this up at uh, one of our meet uh, meetings uh, last month, um, when we had the testimony from Ms. Dara Goldberg about the ability of LCSWs in the, in the DMV to potentially provide um, sort of contract PRN part-time services. I know um, LCSWs and, and school psychologists, there is some alignment in their areas of work. Is that something that we have decided we can do so that we can sort of fill some of these gaps that she identified? Do we have Mr. Monteleone here? Oh, okay. Well, come on up, sir. Good afternoon or evening, <laughs> everybody. Um, so the, the the issue uh, with the school psychologist. First of all, let me say that that we've been we've been working with uh, MCEA and the school psychologist <laughs> since last year on this issue. And and one of the things, and I know that it's it's not going to solve the problem. That we are happy to reach an agreement with MCEA to provide stipends of up to four thousand dollars a year for coverage. So we're we're really trying to ensure that those who are covering. Um, are, are remunerated, right, as they should be for that. With respect to uh, the clinical social workers, I believe, is that who you're referring yeah. to, and the psychologists, the way we currently have them, it's, it's really two separate, distinct roles at this time, with the clinical social workers having uh, individual caseloads by school, working through the, the student well-being teams, and the psychologists having their traditional load that they have, where a lot of it is academic testing. Um, and that's really the, the lens that we're talking about here. That's really a lot of the work that we're talking about covering from the school psychologists is around the testing for 504s or IEPs or EMTs and things of that nature. Um, and it's not just the actual performance of the test, it's the amount of paperwork that goes into that beforehand and after that assessment so that the report is written. And so there's, it's really the time with the student doing the assessment and time after. Um, and so at this particular time, our social workers are not, um, they weren't hired for this purpose. They don't have that background, that experience. Um, so we haven't gone down that road as of yet at this time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, I just echoing uh, Dr. Joftis's comment about turf, there's never good news about turf. Um, and um, I think Ms. Wolf and a couple of us were at the presentation at the Parks Department at Wheaton Regional Park a couple of weeks ago, and it was just so much, I see so much opportunity when we have a Parks Department that is so committed to sustainable, sustain, you know, just really cutting edge sustainability practices and developing and installing high impact, high use grass fields um, and building this, the manpower, the person power, and the technology um, to do that reliably. So that might be something that we can, as we are looking at the ongoing concerns around turf that we can can look at uh, in that partnership as they grow that. Um, and I did just want to thank you, Dr. Uh, McKnight, for the and the students for raising um, issues around um, what I view as arcane rules and policies at the state level that really do get in the way of students achieving and students being able to take advantage of unique opportunities in which they find real value. And, um, you know, as a, as a CTE teacher, this was something that I felt very strongly about because I would ask my students, and of course you ask them, they're going to give you a straight answer, um, why more, that, why they thought um, more students didn't take advantage of the opportunities at Edison. Realizing that, you know, in that space, we were asking students to commit to one, two, possibly three years of a triple period investment at Edison, so spending half their school day at Edison for a course that hopefully with hard work and good instruction would get them to an, a, an a industry level licensure or certification, but they were only going to get elective credit for that. And even when that, you know, some of that content is very science heavy, I took, taught a course that included, you know, college level pathophysiology and students couldn't get a science credit for that. Um, our students taking Cybersecurity and network operations couldn't get a tech credit for that. And when I, I you look at, um, so that was a barrier right there. Uh, we, all we, you know, we make this commitment, then we have to sc scramble to find ways in our homeschool schedule, often squeezed out in their homeschool schedule because they're only there for half a day for one, two, or three years. And they're um, having to 
as was alluded to, take some graduation requirements in the summer school. Um, and I mean, I think big picture, we need to take this question to the state. Is we are in a, a we are in a perfect storm to really wholesale soup to nuts reevaluate what we force every student to do to say at the end of this journey we're going to give you a Maryland diploma, and if it doesn't it, and we need to ask that question very intentionally because if it doesn't make sense anymore for preparing students in the first third you know getting to the, the end of the first third of the 21st century, then it we need to be willing to say this doesn't make sense anymore. And when we, when we look at another one of my concerns that I've been looking at for years is there's something called the double dipping rule that is a reason I have heard advanced in many different quarters for why students taking a, a perhaps a multi-year course sequence CTE pathway like CASE at Northwood or Sherwood, which is very environmental science heavy, none of those courses can count as a science credit. And it's because of, even if, and they do meet NGSS standards because we've already done the analysis, even if that was true, um, because they're getting uh, a completer for that, it's double dipping, so they can't get another, they can't get a, a specific graduation credit for that if they're getting, if in some other way it helps them to achieve a requirement for graduation. That doesn't make sense. That is just an obstacle to student achievement and students being able to take advantage of, of opportunities. You know, looking at the, the Teacher Academy in Maryland pathway, that third year course is curriculum writing. That should be an English credit. And you know, it's, it's just, we need to take a more common sense look at what we're asking and requiring students to do and make sure that they are part of that conversation because I think our students are telling us they're seeing very, very pragmatically things that could change to make their student journey more meaningful, less stressful, and more relevant. And I, I really am, applaud the students for doing that work. I applaud you and others here who really want to see us take that, that position forward to the state level and really work with our state partners to say, why are we doing this? Why are we saying that? Because, you know, we want these students to take advantage of these unique opportunities, some of which do require quite an, quite an, an, a commitment on their part. And I sometimes look at the rules and the regulations and policies, I'm like, we're not honoring the commitment that they're making and how hard that work is sometimes, especially multi-year course sequences. So that's all I'm going to say, but I'm so happy to see this argument coming forward in so many levels from our students who are, you know, they're the ones living it every day and the willingness around the table to really not just say, well, the state says we have to but to say why is that? Okay. All right, I think we have heard from everyone. We're now up to item, the revised item number five, which moved number six to number five first. Dr. McKnight. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wolf, for that discussion. Um, very insightful. And it's so interesting. I feel like this is going to be a natural transition <laughs> because as we are talking about innovation as it relates to courses for our students, um, and Ms. Harris, thank you for that because, I mean, really what it comes down to is um, years and years and years of traditions. And now is a great time to ask the question, why are we doing this? And does it make sense for what we're doing right now? So I want to take that same thinking into the conversation that we're going, the next two sections of the conversation around the school calendar. So for this one, um, we actually want to bring an amendment to our um, current 2022-2023 school calendar. And before I read the resolution, I want to connect this amendment to the calendar work that we'd done last year um, and relate it to uh, an experience that we discussed before. The current school calendar includes two system-wide closures, the day before Thanksgiving and Juneteenth, which have become actually two changes that, that we've made in our calendar as of last year. And we adopted our calendar in January of last year. We had not yet fully experienced or knew, knew the impact of additional closures during winter break and spring break at that point. 
Overall, we had collected information about the experiences and found that uh, the experience and subsequent feedback was positive. So while the addition of these closures, um, and I'm speaking about our 12-month employees, um, did not impact instructional days and hours for teaching and learning, they did allow for the system to recharge. And we said that we thought that was really important um, given many of the circumstances that it put a strain on our operations over the last few years. And um, we also wanted to be able to look at a calendar that was very similar to our neighboring districts. Um, you know, we've been looking at this actually for, I know, at least three years in Montgomery County, looking at how some things within our calendar was not aligned to many of our neighboring districts. And I think that's important to always take into consideration because uh, here in Montgomery County, we actually are fortunate enough to have staff who want to work here and they live in other places and if they have children they oftentimes have to navigate the changes in those schedules and so this is another way to honor that so um, additionally this amendment to the 2023 calendar further aligns with the best of last year and what we are proposing for next year so I will read the resolution um, that we are bringing forward for this change and it is a resolution for the amendment of the 2022-23 school year calendar and it reads uh, Montgomery County Public Schools, school base, and central office continue to work hard as students and staff has transitioned back to having students in school five days per week with no COVID restrictions. Modifications made to the 2021-2022 traditional and innovative school year calendar proved to have positive impacts and were well received by all stakeholders. System-wide closures and additional days of break more commonly are seen as a best practice in neighboring and comparative school districts nationally. MCPS introduced a new designation of system-wide closure last year and used system-wide closure in this year's calendar on Wednesday, November 23, 2022, and Monday, Monday, June 19, 2023, to denote a time when all schools and offices were closed and staff in all locations were able to be off with no loss of wages or leave. Um, the 2022-2023 traditional and innovative school year calendars may be modified to make Thursday, December 29th and Friday, December 30th, Wednesday, April 5th and Thursday, April 6th, 2023, system-wide closure days for Montgomery County Public Schools. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the 2022-23 traditional and innovative school year calendars will be modified to make Thursday, December 29th and Friday, December 30th, Wednesday, April 8th and Thursday, April 6th, system-wide closure days for Montgomery County Public Schools and be it further resolved that the Board of Education adopt the proposed modifications to the Montgomery County Public Schools 2022-2023 traditional and innovative school calendars. Move approval. Second. Is there any discussion? Ms. I, I just have a real quick question. Can you just speak very briefly to how we're addressing um, concerns about making sure that people who have to work, um, I don't know if there's conversations, I don't actually, do they get paid time and a half to, to ho I'm assuming it's holiday pay if this, or we're considering these like holidays or, or um, just how we're making sure that everyone is feeling like this involves them that they can see themselves in this. To address your, your questions about people who have to work last year, I think one of the biggest differences was that we had five schools that we moved and we, we really dug in deeply to see what were the operational impacts this year. So for the staff who are going to work, those are system-wide closure days and they will be paid on days where there are holidays, um, identified holidays that are on our calendar that are identified in that way, they will be paid through the holiday pay. And so one of the big things that we do is we will send a communication to our staff to make them aware as well as we will send it to um, our timekeepers, the people who actually pay them at the different work sites. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? <coughs> all right, all in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous, thank you. Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, so we're ready now. We just talked about amendments to our current calendar. We're now ready to move into a conversation about the 23, 24, school calendar. Um, before our district-wide operation team begins, and I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Hollis to the table. Welcome back, Ms. Edwards. Um, I want to highlight a few key elements that's driven our work to the point of what we are presenting today. Um, the first thing that I want to highlight is in the calendar, our focus remains on instruction and instruction for our students, um, and this relates to our strategic plan of academic excellence. 
and we have to be very thoughtful about what that means and what it means for our students, particularly as we look at student learning data and consider all of the impact of COVID-19 over the last couple of years. Um, and so this extends into the function of the calendar and its development. Um, the scenarios thoughtfully consider the balance of the continuity of instruction for students knowing that that is our priority um, and also the ongoing professional development opportunity for our staff. I just want to say, this is one of the spaces of innovation that I think we really need to look at. Um, when we think about a school calendar and what it was meant to do when it was first established in history, we know that it was around very much an industrialized system um, in which it was established. Earlier, we were talking about the importance of summer school and how we've seen more and more of our families extend for the extended learning opportunity because they are enrolling in our summer school and that's saying that they want to be able to continue the continuity of learning um, and we need to take that into consideration considering um, what we're seeing in our student performance data <clears throat> and so we can invest in that and value the time that our students are having in the classroom but we have to equally balance the time that we are giving to our teachers to build their craft and to understand the differentiated needs that students have to have in the classroom to make that impact on their learning. Um, it cannot be one without the other. Um, I would say it would be remiss if we had students sitting in a classroom every day for seven, eight hours a day, and if we don't have the teacher in the classroom who's equipped to provide the skills and knowledge to them, then that's just time spent, but time not making an impact. And I know every single one of our teachers want to do that. That's why they came into this profession. But we also have to acknowledge that that has become more and more difficult, okay, over time. Um, as we think about students' needs and how we need to differentiate for their instruction, we have to invest in our teachers learning their craft, really figuring out how to uh, make sure we have spaces of literacy being taught across all content areas, making sure that we know, spend the time to know the learners really well so that when we need to make adjustments that's going to um, further their learning and progress them to be college and career and community ready, that the teachers know how to do that. So I know I've been talking about this since we were over in the auditorium, but this connects to one of the initiatives, which was the out of school time. As we begin to build our calendar out this year and years to come, you're going to see there being more investment in teacher professional development time. But I also know our community, as they should, is wondering what is my child going to be doing on those days or during that time when our teachers are getting the professional development that they deserve. Well, I feel that we have to be creative and innovative to create the space so that is not a concern or a question for our families. And so, you know, uh, yesterday we were celebrating our partners who are a part of our out of school time initiative uh, and how important they are because we have everything we need right here in our community in Montgomery County Public Schools along with the expertise to make sure that we have those learning extended opportunities available to our students when our teachers are in fact getting the professional development. So our out of school time initiative has been in place. We, we piloted some um, activities last year and you're going to see there being more time um, focused in our calendar that we present as options moving forward to make sure that we can continue to build on that. To me, this is going to be our path moving forward to make sure that our calendar reflects that innovation that we're talking about that is much needed. And so that means how do we make sure the time that our students are spending in the classroom is quality time that we know is focused on the learning needs that each and every one of them have and that their teachers are able to deliver. And we're able to do that through providing more professional development opportunities to support our teachers, while also taking away the word from our community members of what are our students doing when they are not in school. So I look forward to the 408 students on November 7th that are going to join us at Top Golf because that's an example <laughs> of one of our um, one of our out of school time initiatives in which we're also using that time to expose our students to different types of activities, hoping to build their interest and exposure to areas and experiences that we know just become more valuable as it relates to their educational journey. So I wanted to share that with you because this is, it was so natural to move right to this conversation because this is a big space and opportunity of innovation for us. And I know that <clears throat> 
Mr. Hollis and Ms. Edwards have spent the time to really engage with our community to get feedback from them about what's important to our community so that that can be reflective in the op options that we bring forward. But I also wanted to share with our community um, how they, want, they should take comfort in seeing us beginning to embrace more of that professional development opportunity for our teachers because we are taking, on, taking the responsibility on this end to think about how we can have the experiences available for our students in those days so they don't become competing forces. There's just no need for them to compete. We can do both and all of it as we should. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to bring this forward and I am going to uh, turn this over to Ms. Edwards and Mr. Hollis. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. McKnight laid the foundation for the excitement around the 2023-2024 school year calendar. And I am excited to return to the work around the school year calendar. When I first started the work with the school year calendar, we were looking at ways as a district to align professional days with religious observances. And so we have come a very long way in that. And so as we talk today, we will talk about a couple of different areas that we believe are exciting and we will look at some scenarios that we have probably not seen before but we want to bring them forward. I do want to say as we get started there is no perfect calendar. However, there is a process that we put in place that we lead up to making these scenarios that involve so many voices, so many thoughts, and so many perspectives. And so what you will hear from um, Mr. Hollis today is really the way in which we have engaged so many people in different ways, and our process has been different for this year. And so as we have engaged stakeholders, it's been very important for us to think through those equity questions and really think to ourselves, who have we heard from and who have we not heard from? And so when we think about who have we not heard from, we have to ask ourselves why and in what ways and which what ways didn't we engage and how could we do that in a different manner that really meets the needs of the individuals that we'd like to talk to. And then as we look at these four scenarios today, we talk about how we approach really the instructional structure for students that we're going to bring to you today, who does this advantage and who, does, who doesn't it advantage? I'm sorry, who does it advantage and who does it disadvantage? And we have to look through the lens when we think about that for students. There's a component for families because they send their students to us. There's some times where kids are with us and when they're not. And then we also have to think about our staff. So as perfect as it may seem, there are a lot of complexities that come to the table as we bring this calendar to you, but yet and still, we are still excited. And then the second part is um, really thinking about the different approach that we took. In years past, we've done it where we've just brought a scenario forward and heard input around the process. What you'll hear from us this year is taking a step back and hearing interests first. What are things people want to see in the calendar? Really thinking about perspective and experience and then moving to building out scenarios and having people actually engage with those. That's different for us as a, as a district. It's also different for us with this particular process, but we have found it beneficial with our community members. So it takes a little bit longer, but we actually believe that when we come back in December after hearing from policy management, as well as the board, as well as the community, that we will have something that we will be able to stand up and move forward for the coming year that meets all of the board's priorities and really being able to provide us the outlook for the future. I do wanna thank Mr. Hollis for his leadership with this process, as well as all of the community members, stakeholders, students, staff, as well as families who have participated in multiple ways and in multiple manners in order to be able to take us to this point. So thank you very much. And we look forward to a, an extremely rich discussion on four scenarios that we we hope you will find very interesting and thought-provoking for the coming year. So if you shift to the next slide, again, as I share our priorities, um, what you'll hear today do align with the board's priorities in terms of how that calendar will come forward um, and really thinking about how we hone in around the academic excellence. And Dr. McKnight talked about the professional excellence that we look forward to building out with our staff. On the next slide, 
in terms of just the framing around where we are today, the school year calendar is really where we'd like to see ourselves take some time and benefit, and then you will hear a presentation about college and career readiness. Um, and really thinking about the essential questions that have been highlighted by the board for staff to consider. Good evening, I'm Doug Hollis, Executive Director in the Office of District Operations. Uh, next slide. Um, here on this slide, we will just highlight for you just some of the timeline and actions that we've taken to get here. Um, we always love to anchor ourselves in, in, in the last time we approved the calendar. Um, and so we did that in January. We thought that we did good work around that. And, and, and to, to the points that, that Dr. McKnight and Mrs. Edwards has already made, there was some critical things that happened. And I really want to highlight the work of the Policy Management Committee um, and, and Mrs. Mondrowski. Um, because she pushed us in December of last year to say we should hear from the public a little bit more. Um, and, and I think it was a good idea for us at that time. I don't want to do it every year, but I think it was a good idea at that time for us to suspend policy IDA um, and have an opportunity to hear from the public. And what we found in the survey responses then, and it was about four or 5,000 people that responded, um, we had more write-ins than, than we had received in a long time. And people were beginning to really give us an idea of their interest. Um, and so that has led a lot to what we've done over the summer um, and then us coming together with the calendar committee. Um, and then what I would like to highlight here is this period in September, September 29th through October 24th. Um, it, it provided an opportunity for us to say, should we ask first what people want to see in a calendar? Um, and, and really base some of the questions in that survey um, on some of the feedback that we had received um, through December and early January before we approved the last calendar. Um, and so we had that opportunity. Um, it really guided us in a way that I think has been different. Um, excited to share that data with you today. Um, almost 19,000 responses um, to that survey, um, a huge number for us. Um, and, and, and really, I just think it's more about people's interest in the topic. Um, last Thursday, we were able to come to the Policy Management Committee, um, and, they give us, and they gave us some feedback um, and some directions about how they wanted us to, to share with you all today. Um, we feel very comfortable about that. Um, and then following this meeting, uh, based on the direction you give us, um, we will be able to go back out to the community broadly and ask them what they think about what scenarios uh, this, this board decides we should push forward. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. Um, and, and then November is that month of hearing that feedback and then finally making a recommendation in December. Um, and so we're excited about that. Next slide. This slide is, is kind of the slide I like to say is the things that we must do. Um, and, and, and so in many ways, the things that are in blue are really state mandated. Um, those are uh, state mandated holidays. Uh, what you do see two things highlighted in gray, Dr. McKnight already mentioned those things, are system-wide closures we've added. Um, that really impact in some way the school year calendar. Um, as, as she stated and as you will see in the scenarios, um, what you all have um, approved as an amendment to the 22-23 school year calendar, we have included that, um, but it really has no impact on the days of instruction um, or the days of teaching. Um, but these are the things that are mandated by the state. Um, and the other big piece by the state is the number of days and hours. And so 180 days, but MCPS likes to be a little bit better. Um, and so we still have a calendar that has 182 days. Um, and so we're excited to continue to bring forward that. And if there's ever a time where we could add in more, we would, um, as long as we can figure out how to do that um, and make sure it's financially sound. And so these are the things that, that we wanted to just share as uh, the parameters from the state. Um, speaking about that, I want to turn to the next slide and just highlight uh, something else from, from the state. And this is something that Dr. McKnight just alluded to um, and how we creatively think about things. Um, the, the state um, sees last year and the opportunity to have virtual um, days as a successful opportunity and endeavor. Um, and I think that says a lot from a state superintendent who initially uh, did not want to do anything virtually. I mean, his, his position was, was strong on that, but I think he does see some value in it. And I think in the conversations with the state superintendents and Dr. McKnight has continued to have conversations with them and will continue to do so, there are opportunities, but not just around inclement weather. Um, the idea around, could you take a professional day? 
um, and make an opportunity for there to be some virtual instruction, maybe some asynchronous, um, and, and have an opportunity for students to still get credit for a day of instruction while we still are allow, allowing our staff um, to have an opportunity to further develop themselves for when they return into live instruction again, uh, they're better equipped. Um, and there are some other pieces that the state has also mentioned in terms of uh, maybe during high school graduations and other circumstances to consider around this. As we also mentioned, um, you, you cannot have these additional days away from schools, just like the closures, without thinking about out of school time. And so that is something that has to continue to grow. Um, it's a commitment of the, the office of the chief academic office. Um, and Peggy Pugh has really spent some time looking into that and seeing how we continue to grow that endeavor. And so you'll continue to see that in us um, as we move forward um, in the coming years. Next slide. Next here is just some of our stakeholder engagement. Um, I just want to start and thank the, the calendar committee, which really is comprised of um, staff members from all over MCPS and throughout our schools, all types of our schools. Um, are, are recognized and a part of that. Um, we, we are about 30 to 35 people uh, that meet on a regular basis. They have really been tremendous um, to have members from every association, um, to have perspectives that I think um, we sometimes forget or don't think about um, has been excellent. And so to have that calendar committee to be kind of the, the place where we can have a think tank um, and really try to work through some of the other engagements has been incredible. Um, the Innovative School Year Committee um, continues to meet on a regular basis. Uh, not only do they look at scope and sequence and curriculum, uh, they also look very deeply at their calendar, its impacts to its community. And so they know that they are trying to pair alongside of uh, the development of the traditional calendar um, an opportunity for their communities of Roscoe Nitz and, and um, Arcola uh, to both experience um, a, a co cohesive but a, a, a challenging but great school year for them as well. Um, and then there's a lot of other folks that we've had here. Um, I really want to thank uh, students. Um, we've, we've met with a group of students already. Um, thank you, Mr. Kim. He allowed us to hang out uh, with his advisory board the other day. Um, really, really great feedback there. Um, and I also want to just note, um, and, and I'll show this in the survey data, but I, I have to say it. Three weeks ago, the percent of the people who had responded to the survey were 7% students. Today is 24%. Um, and that just speaks to the, the level of engagement from, from folks like Shella Cherry, but also Mr. Kim and students who are actively engaged in these conversations. Um, and then there's so many different student groups here, but then we also have our parent groups, um, MCCPTA, um, Family Engagement Advisory Team, um, Feet always invites me back over and over to discuss it more. Um, our, our, our SAG groups um, have been tremendous and are, are setting up more opportunities for us to have more um, small group settings and conversations with them. Um, and then there are just so many other people that we must always include as we have learned so much from our anti-racist audit and the work that we did to engage folks. So this is just the beginning. And, and as I say, we've done a lot to this point. Um, but as much as like everyone else is focused on the survey and doing that individually, I really love the month of November because that's when I really have the more time to work with small groups to hear really that qualitative kind of what are you really thinking? Um, what, what, are, what are the impacts and how this really um, means, what does this really mean to you and your community? Um, so that's just the engagement piece. Uh, next slide. Here we just wanted to really share with you all kind of the way that we looked at the calendar process. Um, and, and so what I would say is we did a survey and we gathered interest. Um, and before that survey closed, we began to, um, I would say, workshop um, some of those scenarios and some of the premises, the elements that we saw in the survey. And so that's where we are clearly in a phase two. I think the work that we've continued to do with the Policy Management Committee and the work that we will conclude on in some ways tonight um, is really where we end phase two. And then we'll move to phase three, which is where we're really receiving feedback from the broader community and in some of these small groups that I've mentioned uh, to see what we really should be doing for next year's calendar. And so just really wanted to highlight kind of the phases of that, the gathering of interest that leads to the development of surveys. Next slide. 
So this is some of our data and, and just want to point out a few things. Um, questions one and two um, from our data really highlight uh, the, the who, um, who responded to our survey. And so you will see uh, the role or their connection to our community uh, with parents and guardians being uh, the largest group of individuals that responded. Um, and then you also will see uh, the breakdown of ethnicity. Um, I also want to highlight some of the, the groups that we mentioned um, on the previous slide. Um, our, our numbers in some of our um, Asian, Black, or African American, Hispanic, Latino communities, the numbers were, were lower than this. Uh, they have improved, but we know that we have more work to do, um, particularly when we do this next phase of surveying to receive feedback. Um, we want to make sure that we're hearing from all voices. Um, I do feel confident about uh, the, the ability to hear representative voices in a qualitative way, uh, but we want that to also show in our quantitative way, and, and so we, we just have to continue to do that work. Um, it's the responsibility of all of us, um, and, and, and I'm committed to it, and I know um, many of you all are as well. Um, questions three and four begin to ask folks what they're looking for in the calendar. So question three is really around uh, federal holidays. And so there was that slide earlier around state mandated holidays. I think being in this region, um, many people say, well, there's some federal holidays that you're not recognizing. Why don't we have those days off? Um, and, and that is not to offend anyone or to say those days aren't important, but in many ways, it's just we have tried to observe and recognize so many things in MCPS. It had become a challenge for us, but we thought it would be good to ask um, folks what they thought about uh, these days as well. Um, and so particularly Veterans Day that falls in November, as well as Indigenous People Day uh, that falls um, in October. And so you'll see kind of the results here where some people are saying both, but there's also a very close second of people are saying neither. Um, and so there's, there's no clarity, um, I would say, or, or, or distinct path here, but I do think it's important for us to at least recognize that. Question four um, begins to ask the question that we've been asking for many years, I think, around this table, around the, the religious observances or cultural observances um, that, that often come about in the year that really impact um, our school system. I, I think that there are about five or six, depending on the, the moment that you're asking, that truly um, have come up for us before, uh, those being Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, uh, as well as Diwali, um, Lunar New Year, and then Eid. The other one is um, Passover that sometimes aligns itself really close to spring break and Easter um, being a, a state mandated kind of requirement, um, but it doesn't always. Um, and so those are the things that we've continued to hear. hear um, and uh, it seems that the majority of folks are saying, um, we should look at all of these as non-instructional. Um, now, we all know uh, that there are some give and takes when we do that. Um, I have to acknowledge this year is favorable. If I look at those five, uh, not including Passover, um, those five, three of those fall on a week, on a weekend. Um, and, and so there is no direct impact um, to our instructional day, our instructional calendar. Um, so we may be able uh, to put forward in our scenarios this year something that we haven't done um, in the past that may not be as easy to do in the future as well. Um, but I, I do th thought it was necessary to at least acknowledge that question. Question five, I think, um, and, and, and I hope Ms. Smondrowski doesn't mind this, but I, I kind of named this her question um, in many ways, because this is the one that says, if we were to do something radical, what would radical look like possibly? Um, and, and I think Mr. Kim has some thoughts about um, even more radical than this. Um, but I would just say this one here um, does begin to look at what if I did two weeks for winter break? Um, what if I did a full week for Thanksgiving? There are some school districts around the country that are doing that, right? And so what does that look like? And so as you'll see, uh, there seems to be some interest or greatest amount of interest um, in a longer winter break. Um, and, 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 and the possibility of that. Um, and then there seems to be some similarities and responses um, or percentage around uh, the shorter breaks, um, doing nothing, or Thanksgiving uh, being a full week. So those are those pieces there. And then finally, um, we know that there are impacts to any changes we make. Um, and so we really just wanted to see if people had a, a clear idea around how we should handle those impacts. Can we start a little earlier? Should we go a little later? Um, or just, you know, kind of don't do anything to our calendar. 
And so those are the pieces that, that, that are here. Um, you'll see that these are fairly evenly split. Um, and so that's really the background work and contents. Um, I think um, most of you all probably want to see and hear about scenarios. And so I'm ready to turn to that unless there's any immediate questions now. Um, just something to keep in mind in the future. I, the, some of the ways I feel like the survey questions are asked, I think, could be a little con confusing. So just to give you one example, um, uh, the number four, I, I think out of context, that's a hard question to answer, right? So um, anyway, I think we can talk. I would agree. We no. should talk further about it. But there's a couple where I would be kind of like, well, I don't know. But we, we can fair. talk further about it. And I, and I will say, um, and, and I appreciate that, um, I think um, one of the challenges with surveys is, one, how do I make it fast and easy for yeah. folks? And then, two, the depth of understanding of some folks who sit in, in these kind of conversations often versus the broader public. Um, how do I define non-instructional day versus right. professional day? What right. does that really mean and indicate for folks? So that is something that I, we, we have to make sure that we improve upon uh, to make sure it's accessible yeah, to it's everybody. Required. No, but, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep working on it. I appreciate that. All right, next slide. And one more slide, please. So here are some of the key considerations before I show you um, four different scenarios. Um, the first, as, as Mrs. Edwards uh, shared earlier, is an equitable approach. Who's advantaged or disadvantaged by particular features that you'll see represented in the calendar? Um, the other piece is just the interest survey. Those results, in many ways, drove um, what the elements are that you start to see um, in these calendar scenarios. Um, highlighting interest and features and then presenting actionable, actionable scenarios. So as I told you, there was a phase in which we started to workshop this. And as I began to workshop it, we, we were sharing elements and features and people just couldn't chew it. Um, they needed to see it in a survey. Show me a, show me a scenario that I really can look at and understand what you mean and what that looks like. Um, and so as much as um, I wanted it to be in some ways organic, I realized that there are some pieces of what we've done in the past, even in that earlier stage of getting um, initial feedback to start to develop scenarios, that we had to start to put some things together that actually went together in pieces that made us have the state mandate, mandated days off, the number of instructional days we needed, 195 days um, for our staff members um, who are those 10-month employees. So those are the pieces that we had to make sure we had a balance of. Um, we have a commitment to our instructional days, um, and we also have a co commitment to professional opportunities. Um, Dr. McKnight has already highlighted uh, the possibility of, of, of combining the two at some point, um, but also just thinking about what that looks like um, in these calendar scenarios. Um, and then just the idea of like, we need to have continuity of instruction, but as we heard so much last year and we continue to hear, um, folks need to recharge. Um, and, and, and so when do I have an opportunity to take a breath and recharge? Um, and so those are the other pieces here, um, innovative school year and extended school year, summer opportunities, and whatever we do with the calendar in terms of when it starts and ends has an impact on what happens oftentimes in the middle um, of, of that summer period. Um, and then the other piece is benchmarking other school districts. Um, in our initial packet uh, that we shared with you all with the memo, we did start to share, share with you all also the other school districts beginning and end dates, which show that we're, we're fairly aligned with most school districts. Um, our current start time, but particularly our end time within um, that second um, week of June is where we've normally been landing. And so those are the pieces that I just wanted to highlight. And now we'll move to um, some scenarios. So let's look at the next slide and we'll look at scenario A. So scenario A, um, pretty quickly I'll highlight a few things here. Um, we start on, on the 21st of August, um, which is a full week earlier uh, than we normally would. Um, Traditionally, the last few years, we have started uh, the last Monday in August. This scenario shows us starting um, two Mondays, um, so a week before that, so August the 21st on that Monday. Uh, this also shows us ending the school year on June the 13th. Um, 
And then I would say the big highlight of this one is probably when you get down to December. Um, in December and the first week of January, you will see um, a lot of colored days there. Point blank is two weeks off. This is what it looks like in our calendar if we had two weeks off of instruction um, and teaching um, in our schools. And so what you will see is the holidays, uh, the system-wide closures, but you also will see some non-instructional days. Um, and so what that means for families is um, also uh, three weekends, if you really think about that. Three weekends, uh, a weekend leading into uh, the winter break, a, a weekend in between those two weeks, and then one at the end. Um, so a real period of, of really uh, taking a breath for folks. The other thing I would like to highlight here um, is um, outside of the first um, the third week in November or the fourth week in November, the November 20th and 21st, uh, those are early release days. We generally have used those as parent-teacher conference days. Um, so outside of that, you only see one other early release day on this calendar. But you do see four light pink days, um, and those are professional development days. And so you will see that there are two different colors of professional development days. There are light pink, and then there are some that are more royal blue. Um, as it, I think shows on the screen or maybe your papers. Um, the royal blue ones really indicate the end of a quarter. Um, and, and so that is something that we've always had uh, for grading and reporting. The light pink um, represent an opportunity for us, I think, um, to really develop our staff, for staff to uh, further uh, engage in their own learning uh, so they can provide to, to um, students. Um, I will note that on October 9th and March the 13th, uh, those two light pink ones, you will see an asterisk. And, and that asterisk really reference, and we haven't indicated in the, the legend here, it really indicates the ongoing conversations that Dr. McKnight and her executive team are having with the state superintendent. These may be opportunities um, for us to look at um, if this is something that we really feel could be a path forward to say, could this be a professional development day and a day uh, potentially for virtual instruction. Uh, so both of those things could happen. And so that is why that is indicated that way. Uh, but I would say the big highlights about scenario A is we start a week earlier. Uh, you have two week break in the middle, um, last week in December and the first week in January. Um, and you will find um, um, two additional professional development days, um, but a total of four of them outside of uh, the grading and reporting days. Did you say that the light pink was those potentially virtual? So uh, October the 9th and October the 13th, and on all the scenarios, you will find uh, there's some PD days that have an asterisk by them. Those are the ones that, that we've indicated that way. Thank you. Yeah, one per semester. Next slide. This is scenario B. Um, so there are some similarities with the last one. I, I think the direct comparison is we will begin at the same time. Uh, the end time on this one, though, is actually June the 7th. Um, so you see the true impacts of, um, if I really didn't add a, a two-week break in here, uh, the idea of getting out um, a little bit earlier than we normally would. Um, but I also want to note that in November, um, you will see two standalone early release days on the 9th and the 10th. Those are meant to be the professional development days, I mean, excuse me, parent-teacher conference days. Um, and they are aligned or very close to uh, when the Veterans Day holiday would be. Um, and then when you look at the week of Thanksgiving, the 20th through the 24th, um, you will notice that that is a full week off. So the highlights of scenario B are we start a week early, um, but we have a full week off for Thanksgiving. Um, and so those are the biggest pieces, I, I think, of this scenario uh, that are unique to us. Uh, the first one, uh, unique because two weeks off in winter, but this one, um, one week off for Thanksgiving. Uh, the, the other things kind of remain the same or similar to things that we're accustomed to seeing. Next slide. Scenario C. Um, I'll indicate the, the start date again, August the 24th here, um, which is midweek. Um, so that's one of the unique features here. Um, we started earlier, um, but we just started two days earlier. 
Um, and, and one of the ways that I've discussed this in small groups with folks is the idea, and we've heard some principals and teachers and others kind of say it, and even students, uh, the idea of it's been a long summer, I come back to school, and it's a lot all at once. And if I had two days to kind of jump in and then have a weekend to say, all right, let me have my mind right. Let me make sure I'm really ready to do this. I have no choice but just having a, a, a place to dip my toe in the water um, and then come back and really engage um, is something that some individuals have shared that there was an interest for. Um, so instead of a week early, this shows more of just two days early. Um, the other piece here, um, I would say, is there are no differences in the Thanksgiving break. There are no differences in the winter break than what we normally would do. But we will see in February a cluster of days uh, around President's Day. Um, so this indicates what it looks like if I had maybe a mini little break, right? And, and so D.C. in this region is a school district that kind of does something around President's Day and has a, a full week or so off. This would show um, a Friday being a professional development day, um, a weekend, then a holiday um, as mandated by the state, and then a non-instructional day. Um, and so that just shows you what that looks like. And then this calendar would end um, on June the 13th. Um, and then finally, um, as we turn to the last slide or the next slide, um, scenario D um, shows us more of a traditional start, um, August the 28th, which aligns with our August the 29th start of this school year, um, last Monday in August. Um, it also shows us um, getting out um, or being done with the calendar school year on June the 13th. Um, you do see a small mini break in Feb February. Um, there, there wasn't space in the way we were counting days to, to figure out um, how to put an additional non-instructional day. Uh, that may be something that we could go back and look closely at if this was something that people really, really liked. Um, but there is the professional development day leading into um, a weekend and then um, President's Day holiday. Um, and then lastly, Thanksgiving and the winter break in, in Scenario D. Um, are very much the same in how we regularly um, address those. Um, so those are the scenarios, um, four different scenarios. Um, I know it's a lot, um, but I am really open to any kind of questions and comments and, and just really want to hear your discussion about it. Um, as we said, this is the development of our, 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 our scenarios, um, and that's part of the phase that we're in and, and the work that the board does to engage in this conversation truly helps us in that way. Thank you. That was a lot to take in. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very pleased, though, that you said 19,000 people. Did you yeah. say 19,000 yeah. yeah. responded yeah. to the survey? That is okay. absolutely amazing. And that 24% of the students participated. That yeah. I'm really impressed by. 24% of the 19,000. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's what I meant, 24% yeah. of the 19,000. So, Ms. Harris, you have some questions? Um, yeah, just briefly, uh, one observation is, so now this is going to, these yeah. very specific um, options are going to go back out for mm -hmm. community. And I would just say, as I was looking, listening and seeing some really different things in some of these, that um, you really highlight you know, for each option, um, the major things that you want people to really notice. For instance, when you've got, we're giving you a week for Thanksgiving, which is something that is going to be new. Or when we're giving you two weeks at over the holiday break in the first of the year. And so that, because sometimes people look at these and they see this and they're like, ah, uh, I don't know. Uh, but when you really focus them on the things Absolutely. we really want you to pay attention to here, the things that really are going to make a difference to what this school year feels like, you know, I think that would be appreciated. And then the other thing, I'm just going to make one observation, which I know, I don't know, may or may not be popular, but um, as a CTE teacher, um, one of the things that impacted me and my instruction was when we, uh, all of the early release days, mm -hmm. because at Edison, that means you get, you get your morning class for a triple period of instruction and you get you don't get your afternoon class at all but then you have to get all those kids to, to the same finish line at the same time 
and then especially the year that we went from the, those two early release days, usually around the 1st of November for the parent-teacher conferences. Originally that was just for the elementary schools who would, who would take that full day for teachers to schedule those appointments with families. And then um, the middle and high schools would, the middle schools would do something different and high schools something different as well, not in the day. And, um, but then we moved, um, the second year I was teaching, um, to every middle and high schools also got those early release days. And again, you know, two back-to-back -back days of early release, if you teach at Edison or the Seneca Valley <coughs> Cluster programs, that's half your group, your, half your students are getting six class periods of instruction and half are getting none. And it really is, it, it really is impactful. Um, so, just an observation. And I, I do want to acknowledge, um, I was thinking about you when, when I was putting these scenarios together. One of the things that we've heard from the community before is this idea of um, consistency, but then at the same time, your past experience and what you shared with us last year um, around the idea of if I make all the early release days on the same day of the week, then in some elementary school, there's some specials that somebody's not getting every time we have an early release day. Or in some programs, such as our CTE programs, there's something that someone's not getting. So that's the part that I think the community may not love as much, but at the same time, I do want to acknowledge that there was some thoughtfulness around that part of not making them all on the same day of the week um, or not doing the easy win, which is always, can we do it on a Friday? Uh, <laughs> um, and, and so I appreciate that, but also uh, your, your comments that you highlighted today. Thank you, Ms. Silvestri. Well, yeah, two questions. Um, the first is, um, is there an academic reason to start the school year earlier, advantage to getting through content um, and my second question is, um, do we have data on attendance? So, for example, are we getting students to come to school on those half days before Thanksgiving anyway? Uh, and does that data influence our decisions for which days we take off in future calendars? Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think it was the last board meeting or the meeting before where we actually brought forward some of the data that we collected from our um, innovative calendar schools. And one of the reasons for that was, of course, we had to take into the limitation of the data was that those schools started the year um, that we were impacted by COVID in the spring. But we did see value in students having that additional <coughs> instructional time, even considering the circumstances. I think that <clears throat> that is what we should continue to study and look at. If you ask about research naturally, there's lots of research that supports how an extended year is a valuable experience for students. So to answer your question, yes, there is a benefit when there is more instructional time. However, I do want to say that there sh I believe there are multiple ways that as a system we should get at that. It doesn't mean that every school in Montgomery County Public Schools should be an innovative calendar school. We have summer school that presents an extended opportunity for students to learn. We have our innovative uh, calendar schools that we engage in. Um, and so we need to look at all of them so that we're not really creating a one-size-fits-all option. It should be multiple options in so many different ways that provides an opportunity for students learning to be extended. And maybe make my question more specific. I'm talking about the calendar option of maybe starting one week earlier. Is there any academic benefit of doing that? Um, there is no research that says one week. <laughs> starting the calendar earlier is going to okay. make that big of a difference academically for students. More time is more time. What I'm, and I'm so glad you clarified that. What I'm talking about is more time that is sustainable over time. That seems to be the more meaningful options. But, but we have the heard testing. The, the right. testing, though, and, and Dr. Manai, we've, we've talked about that before, the, 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 the piece from if we are competing, right? right? And let's just be honest. If in some ways, our students who are in AP, IB, et cetera, are in some ways, we're trying to advantage them to do as best as possible. I think Dr. McKnight's point around starting a little bit earlier puts them in a different place in the school year when those state mandated times or those national times are for those assessments. Um, and so that does advantage some of those families in some ways. But um, I want to push us a little bit on that. Yeah. Because if a student is preparing for an assessment like um, um, 
what's the one that's given? SAT. Thank you, SAT. <laughs> or, you know, because we have students who take it in the fall and throughout Absolutely. the year. Actually, how valuable would it be if we were to provide, whether it may be virtual tutoring, tutoring services online, or whether it may be in-person um, activities that may be provided some by our staff and maybe some not, that still can be available to that student without it being an impact on an entire calendar. I guess what I'm saying is, we can still make that those additional opportunities available for students. It doesn't need to be pushed all in one way through the calendar. The calendar, we, and, and I think it speaks to our process in terms of what does our community value, what do they find most important holistically for operation of the school year. Uh, but that's that's one I would I would push back on a bit because it basically is how early and how soon and how valuable all those services you're providing the students to prepare them for those types of assessments. And I, I am not going to say that one additional week in a calendar for an entire school system is going to make that big of a difference when there are many ways in which we can address that that actually provides flexibility for families. Am I follow my second question about the attendance data? If anyone wants to answer that. We can follow up to see what the attendance is on no, early release just wondering days. If, I was just asking if you were using that to inform which days to take off anyway because students were coming or weren't coming at rates that we would want them to. We had not looked at attendance data. I think the, the biggest piece in building out the calendar is um, we try to look at where there's the least disruption when you really think about early release or where professional development days go. Some of the early release days are contractual days that some of our teachers get in Brown and center with interims as well. Thank you. I'd like to add one more part onto that. So I'm gonna use the example of our innovative calendar schools. So we've studied them and that's why we brought that information forward, but we also collect that qualitative data, which we know is important. And some of you remember we were visiting out to our extended years, uh, our innovative calendar schools. Um, the principals actually talked about it still being a challenge to get families to move um, into starting the school year during the summer once and then months and in some ways they would see their attendance impacted um, up until they would see uh, more cohesiveness when the comprehensive calendar started for the other schools and so and you may remember that Ms. Vestry because I remember you ha having a, a particular reaction to that and saying you know we need to encourage our families this is <laughs> this is when school starts and we mandatory. want um, that's right and it's that's mandatory and we want them <laughs> we want them to engage in that additional learning time but I think we should look at that and also say again what is the flexibility that the community is looking for so they don't they don't have to choose one thing or the other and where the flexibility um, lies you know where does that create opportunity and innovation I mean it's just it's difficult because it's not all one right answer it's just how we got to be willing to try some different things <laughs> and learn from it and be mm -hmm. flexible so, uh, I just want to follow up on Miss Silvestri's question I know that when we visited the innovative schools, it was a challenge getting them to come the first week because a lot of them just had not returned from vacation yet. My question is, do we have any data, and maybe this is what you're getting at, on um, starting school before Labor Day and after Labor Day, since this is a question that comes up every year, any attendance data? on our regular um, regular um, school programs? We would have to go back, especially the years in which we've changed. Mm -hmm. um, when the state changed where we started after Labor Day to then where uh, LEAs had choice. So let us go back a couple of years and pull that. We'll also bring into that um, data pull our ISY schools because then we'll be able to see the difference, you know, between the two. So please give us an opportunity. Yeah, thank you. I was just curious because this comes up every year also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, so thank you all very much. First, I, I really want to um, express very publicly my appreciation for all of the work that you've done on this, Mr. Hollis. I mean, it's been a very long year of conversations. It's, you know, it's, a lot of it actually started last year before we voted on that calendar and talking about what we could potentially do differently. Change is hard for people. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to just share a few things with my colleagues um, who aren't on policy so that they can understand where some of this coming, you know, is coming from. 
Um, so to, um, to some of your points, so when we were having these conversations, one of the things that we did discuss is the um, both not just parents but students' perspectives on when the state mandated that we start after Labor Day and the disadvantages that they felt that they were um, incurring based on the dates of the testing, of the first initial testing, and kids were feeling concerned that that was going to give them a disadvantage. Um, making sure that we maintain the same number of instruction, but breaking it up a little bit more in an effort to address some of the um, learning loss, summertime learning loss, um, and incurred costs for families that um, can't afford to go to sleepaway camps and things like that. Um, one of the things that we discussed was sports and ensuring that sports wouldn't change, which I know Mr. Hollister worked with um, uh, Jeff, uh, Mr. Sullivan, to um, say so. There are a lot of families who we concern, become concerned. You know, are they going to want to come back a week earlier? But any of them who have children that play sports generally have to be back that week, anyways, um, to start participating in practices and things like that. So that would not change. Um, the same number of days. The impact on that being, you know, of course, um, our staff. And, um, and contractual uh, aspects of that. Um, and then just, again, one of the things that we heard um, very strongly, particularly from um, Hana, um, our previous student board member, was um, students feeling like they just needed a break periodically and trying to figure out ways that we could incorporate things like that five-day weekend, if you want to call it that, or four-day weekends here and there. Um, the other big factor in the overall proposal to changing the calendar from our traditional style was, you know, the large number of families that we have here in Montgomery County that travel and have family, you know, overseas. And so giving the two weeks for um, the winter break gives those families an opportunity to go visit other places and, and do other things. Um, so just kind of wanted to put that out there a little bit so that people understood where some of this was coming from and what the um, idea of looking at these possibilities. That and our growing number of um, families that um, observe different religious opportunity or, you know, religious days and um, trying to figure out different ways that we can try and help incorporate some of those off um, more than previously. Um, some of these have changed a little bit from the policy committee meeting. Um, so I'll let my colleagues talk, but I may have some questions about like why did this one early release day go away or um, putting, um, there were some other things that I noticed, um, but, you know, and, and even just in thinking about possibly combining some of the things that we liked about some of the other calendars and incorporating it into one, because that is something that we're able to do. Um, whether, I don't know how that works, because normally we do that at the policy committee meeting, but, um, so I'm not exactly sure procedurally how that would look if, if people had ideas or thoughts that there's things that they like, things that they like on one calendar but like to see on another, like possibly starting on the 17th so that we still have that two-day kickstart as opposed to on the 21st. And then um, we could add, potentially add in a four- or five-day weekend in February where we hear a lot of students saying that this is just a long stretch without any kind of break for them. Um, so again, I'll just break here and hear what everybody else has to say, but there are a couple of other little things that I would ask about looking into. Do you want to respond to that? Tina? I'll just say that once we get down to what we'd actually like to put forward in order to gain feedback, there may be a place where there's a different scenario requested or a combination of one that we will put out for comment. 
So we'll use this time to hear from everyone in terms of just reaction, mm -hmm. as well as suggestions in order to move forward. Because when we end today, our goal is to be able to have a month um, where a survey is open. We want to use that opportunity for our community. And when I say community, every time I say it, I mean students, staff, and families to be able to one, react to scenarios. Two, we want them to provide opportunity, provide opportunity to hear from them. If you remember last year, we talked about if we're in a situation, thinking about our snow days um, and being able to move to virtual instruction sometimes for inclement weather, we want to do that. And then the third part I want to highlight, as said earlier, there are two additional professional development days that are in light pink. And I know the colors are like, it's a lot of colors, uh, <laughs> that are in light pink on the calendar. Those professional development days connect back to what Dr. McKnight said in terms of really leveraging out of school time opportunities um, and also creating more opportunities for professional development for staff. But we have to balance it out. And, you know, that was a part of my pilot work last year with out of school time. And so it wouldn't necessarily be a virtual instructional day for students. But students could participate in virtual out of school time opportunities. And we had a lot of those last year. So we'll, we want to build that survey to really talk about all the things with the calendar. So, Ms. Edwards, um, I just wanted to follow up on the professional development. I was so. I hear you talking about extra professional. How, how many days total are we talking about in terms of professional development days? Or is it different in each calendar? Yeah. So in, in each calendar, um, tr traditionally, we have had the four grading and reporting ones, and then we normally have two. Sometimes there's three. Um, but it really just depends on some of those other observances that yeah. I mentioned. Um, and those four are teachers having time to grade and enter grades and catch up on things they're not technically a professional so those those four um there are some other duties and tasks uh, that, that teachers actually use that time for as well okay um, and part of that is um improvements i think by um, our technology uh, group that allows them to have these grade books that they're able to actually do quite a bit during the course of the school year right. um, but i would just say um in general um, and it's not always an exact science, but yeah. in general, we have about two professional de professional days outside of those four okay. that I just mentioned. And so, what you see in these calendar illustrations here are two more. That's uh, nice. oh, so then so four plus four then right. So oh, you okay. see four. So yes, yeah, so you oh. see four and four, but normally you would see four and two. Okay, got it. Got it. All right. And the other thing, and, and I will say, Miss Mondrowski, uh, a little bit to your point. Um, Sometimes the balance of that was, can I have another early release day? And sometimes, um, really what contractually it speaks about uh, the interim opportunity is really for our staff um, to have some hours um, each in the first, in, in, in each semester. And so traditionally we've done that with um, early release days in the first and third quarter. Um, but in some of those places, a professional development day that is a full day may have taken the place of what used to be designated as an early release day because really we've we've not taken um, yeah that piece and in the feedback just so just to add to that the difference between an early release and a professional development day we've heard the early release has been a little bit more disruptive yeah. than a full day whether it be instructionally family wise um, you know if we plan it out I think it's it's one thing but in looking at the professional development day it's all day it's uninterrupted yeah. time I can be fully engaged in what I need to learn on that day and or my experience thank you you have another question I did thank you um, so I mean just a first point is my concern is the, even with the four four by four professional development days, that seems low to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I know this is a contractual issue, but my understanding of best practices, and you probably know this better than I do, Dr. McKnight, but is closer to 10. Um, does that sound right to you? Or? <laughs> it I know does. that's a lot. And I no, know no, 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 it does. And in full transparency, I'm gonna say we wanted to honor the process and bring forward what our community members had shared. Yeah. I shared with the team that I thought that starting with two additionally was very conservative. Yes. Okay. Um, um, you know, because <laughs> right. of that. 
Um, but we wanted to have this conversation right. again so that we could kind of balance out some of the thinking because what could, what we, what's probably going to happen, and we've done this before, um, Ms. Madrowski with the calendar, is spending the time to collect additional feedback because our community would have had a chance to see and hear this discussion and then coming back to policy um, management because we may develop additional scenarios or, or mm -hmm. modifications to these scenarios to bring back. So that would be ideal. I, I suspect, yeah, I, I suspect that that will be the case here after so, having all the conversations. So the other part of that to me would, and I know this is not really a um, calendar issue, mm -hmm. but I do think it's something we need to think about together, and that's the sort of teacher collaboration time. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are the two drivers of improvement, right? And, and as I said, I, you know, 10 days is what I understand to be sort of best practice, mm -hmm. and then at least an hour a week for real teacher um, collaborative time. And again, I know you can't really build this into this, but I think if we're talking about one of our key goals is creating kind of a learning organization among our staff and continuous improvement among our system, we need to think about um, those two things together, even if the, mm -hmm. again, even you can't calendar out because that's more of a school day calendar thing, but being able to show that we're really trying to expand those opportunities for um, for improvement, I think, is really important. Um, I want to add one part onto that. One of what you just mentioned in terms of the teacher um, planning time, that's also an area we're investigating related to the blueprint. Good, yeah. And you are right. All of this has to be a, a great synergy all coming together, which is exactly what, what we have talked about in terms of not separating this, but the blueprint actually is a big driver to, I think, just about everything we've talked about in this board meeting. Um, so we definitely take that into consideration as well. Um, thank you. Dr. Daka. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Dr. McKnight brought up the SATs and starting school uh, before Labor Day or two days before we usually do. It's very important for people who are taking the SATs the first week in October. Mm -hmm. Every day counts. I tutored for 15 years. I know what it's like to get students prepared, and every hour that you can spend really, really helps them a lot. Um, half days, uh, I, I know what you're saying, Ms. Harris. When we had half days in middle <laughs> school, we had to switch the calendar so that the same periods were not hit every mm -hmm. time for the half days. So you have to be creative, like, but it's a little bit harder with Edison because then the high schools would have to switch their calendars. Well, anyway, I don't know how they would do it, but I think I have heard of them doing that before. Uh, when you speak of half days, and I think you were mentioning them, uh, half days are they're not as good as full days because you've got to keep the kids until they eat. Mm -hmm. And that means there some teachers are only going to have like mm -hmm. two hours free because the students eat much later. So um, those are not the favorites. However, teachers do need those half days at the end of the nine week period because they do work on uh, their grades. But then the administration has to look over those grades. So. Everybody has to work on that together. And I know that I'm a Debbie Downer because we talked about this before. Um, years ago, we had 12 to 13 days that were in-service days. Parents went crazy. Mm -hmm. They said it was too much. They couldn't handle it. And you know, all of you have been here when they talked about the testing going back to 2.5% or something like that. You knew how vociferous the parents were about that. So what we have to do, though, in, is to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages. Right. And who is it advantaging? Mm -hmm. And it's advantaging more people to have those two days off before the last in-service days for, uh, in August. Teachers could really use that because when they got to Friday of the first four, they needed all that time just to prepare in the classroom, even though they'd been working. But they have leadership. They have other training. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have the students come to do their orientation. So there isn't that much time in, in uh, those pre-days. They're very important. And I think the important thing is, too, is that we are 
having talking points about why we're doing this and who it's going to help. And I think that if we all work together on whatever calendar mm -hmm. we come up with, we need to be yeah. able to defend it very well. But I worry about January to spring break. I think there's only one day in there. It's, that's rough, but I don't know what you can do about that. Thank you. Ms. Madrowski and then Mr. Kim. Yeah, so just roughly, um, when I mentioned about the potential for moving the start date up two days or whatever and being able to put back those other two days, I didn't know if that is the kind of thing that could be, because I had written them down as professional development days. I didn't, um, thinking that it might be nice to have back-to-back -back days, but then I, it occurred to me that that might affect contractual, that'll, that'll change our budget line, right? Is that correct? If you, if you move up the start date and make those two professional development days, but they would be in service days already, we definitely would have to determine the number. No, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I meant, um, that is correct about what you're saying. I meant in February, um, where we had, on some of the scenarios, it has the 15th and the 16th um, off as non-instructional days. Could those be professional development days is what I was suggesting. We can definitely examine that, um, which is what this conversation is about, and that's where the energy is moving. So we, we definitely can go back and examine where is the appropriate placement um, for those days to go into. Okay. I, I would I would just add that um, contractually we we have 195 days. Mm -hmm. um, MCPS continues to have 182 uh, student instructional days, mm -hmm. um, and and so if you just add five more for pre-service, mm -hmm. you're at 187. And so then when you begin to say, how many professional days can I have based on 195 days? Right. You see what your limitations are already. And, okay. and so it's just it's just something from a financial standpoint and what we contractually say we have in 195 days, what those limitations are. And I would just add that I, I got you to 187, and now I'm going to add four days that have to be for grading and reporting. So I, I, I have you at 191. Okay. So now I only have four days. Right. In, in, in the span of 195 days. Does it mean that the 195 can't one day be moved? Does it mean other things? I, I just, I just, those are the parameters that, that we were trying to work with them. Well, I would just be interested if, yeah. to know, A, if there is a fiscal note attached to that, uh, something Absolutely. like that, and if Absolutely. there is, how much it would be, because it might, as we talk about increasing professional development opportunities, it could be something that we could think about. Um, I'll let Mr. Kim go ahead. Um, Thank you. Uh, first, I actually wanted to raise a consideration in this conversation about increasing professional development. Uh, I recall that one of the the recommendations of the anti-racist audit is really centered around um, a c kind of a new approach to professional development. One thing I noted was the curriculum base. I think that has to come with really extending what that looks like. So, um, you know, come March when we really find out what that looks like, I, I, I certainly wanted to raise that consideration. Um, uh, this pattern of kind of innovating the school calendar, um, I, I think, brings a lot of merits uh, to our community. But to, to really get the full extent of those merits and, and serve our students and staff, I do think it, it takes kind of radical steps. Um, one way I think that out of these scenarios really reflects that if if our community says that they'd benefit from having a longer break at some point in the year, that two week of a winter break really exemplifies kind of a more radical step of, of um, carrying out those merits and, and bringing them to the community. Um, uh, the extended school year, for example, um, if, if we find that there's merits to having extended school years, of course our innovative school calendar being a great example of that, um, really expanding that uh, more than just one or two days uh, forward uh, I think is another great way to, to bring those merits. And if the opposite is true, if um, our community members find that having more frequent, periodic, uh, shorter breaks throughout the year is, is what they need. Um, that that might be a, a place that's missing uh, out of these scenarios. Um, you know, we've had conversations about uh, the weekly half day, what the implications of that would look like, or, or perhaps once every two weeks, twice a month, a, a non-instructional day, um, and how we can shape um, starting early and ending later around that. So 
uh, that kind of pattern of innovation is, is something I hope to see continued and developed upon. Um, that pattern uh, demonstrated through that, that two week winter break, I, I hope these kind of other considerations can also be reflected um, for the district uh, in general moving forward. Um, you know, that piece of community engagement, seeing all the, the stakeholder groups that were involved, I, I think um, is super meaningful. I hope that's a practice that continues, even out the, you know, with work outside of the calendar. But having those stakeholders involved, I hope that process can go on um, and seeing how we can include these perhaps radical ideas um, and, and working there, um, I, I think would be uh, beneficial. I just want to thank Mr. Kim because he sent us a, a really in-depth follow-up email after policy management committee. And I think you have a future um, as, a, as a person who will make calendars uh, <laughs> because he has some wonderful ideas and good conversation. Um, and, and one note I just wrote down where uh, just really focused on as we increase that engagement just to really talk talk it through with kids too um, and really kind of understand the impact or non-impact just in terms of the flow and the transition for them and their instructional lives. Um, that actually reminds me of one more thing I want to say, you know, well that 25 number, 25% uh, <laughs> of surveys is great. If you do the math, that's only 4,000 yeah. students, right, of yeah. our 160,000. Um, and of course seeing, you know, what communities were involved. Uh, While well, that's certainly progress, certainly from three weeks ago, um, just another area to, to continue to grow in. Absolutely. Ms. Evans. Yes, um, I did want to thank um, Mrs. Edwards and Mr. Hollis for their work. Um, I appreciated the interest, um, taking that out to our community first before bringing back, um, before putting out the scenarios. And what the policy committee wanted to do under the leadership of Mrs. Mondrowski is typically what we do is we narrow down in the committee the calendars that will come forward. But we thought that it would be really great to have the community here an enriched discussion amongst our colleagues to um, just talk about the different scenarios. Um, I appreciated the key scenario, uh, key considerations that we need to think about. Um, hearing from Ms. Harris, right, was really great because you have talked about the early release days and how that impacts um, our CTE program. And we just heard a lot of um, great things that we knew we would hear from you all, from Dr. Joff is talking about how do we, you know, really use um, professional days in a different way. And I just wanted to highlight, so our policy committee was just last week, right? And within that time period, because uh, Mr. Kim and I were talking, I said 7% is really low for our students, considering that they are always really engaged. And so from last week to today, it has gone up to 24%. I just wanted to recognize and highlight that. But um, we really do want to use this time. I heard Mr. Hollis say that, you know, in the month of November is the part that he really likes, that we will continue to engage our community because there are many stakeholders that we did not hear from. So while Absolutely. we heard from 19,000, when you look at the percents, you know, it was still pretty low in some of the categories um, um, of our parents that are like 43%. When you talked about identifying by ethnicity, 43.1% was white, 12.7% was Asian, black or African American, 12.6%. And I'm, I'm repeating what you already heard and what Mr. Hollis um, had mentioned, but you know, as we continue to make sure that we're looking at our work through an equity lens, it's really imperative that we go back out and talk to our families. Because what we do all know is that after we've made really important decisions around policy, that our families come out to say, we had no idea, we didn't right. know this was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So we have the ability to make some changes um, mm -hmm. or create another scenario. I want my colleagues to, to know that, yeah. um, where we see that we had two weeks off for winter, we could take some of those days and sprinkle them, up, sprinkle them throughout the year, right? But we really wanna be creative and, and effective in how we do that. But just to say that we have the ability to make some of these changes and I'm um, just really glad that we, we've done it differently. We talked about being innovative and being creative and thinking yeah. outside the box. And um, 
under the leadership of Dr. McKnight, we are making some really great changes. And Mrs. Smodrowski mentioned in the last meeting, you know, usually we're here for hours in the policy <laughs> committee, but I was like, you know what? But just yep. think about how we've made some strides and improvements mm -hmm. over the years. I mean, I just, I think that the policy committee didn't last as long as it typically does because of the adjustments that we made based off the feedback that we've gotten from exactly. our pair community or community input. So just wanted to highlight that while we may not create a perfect calendar for everyone, everyone may not be satisfied that we're going to do our best yep. to make sure that we're taking all the comments and um, considerations of our stakeholders. So I just wanted to briefly say that and we just really wanted to have the engaged discussion that we're having mm -hmm. and we can make those thoughts or changes or yeah, and to Mrs. Evans' point, um, you know, she, when she I had mentioned to the group, we don't have to move them all forward, and she said, you know, I think that it's when you're, especially when you're trying to make changes, it's really good for people to be able to kind of have a full, a broad range of here's what's possible, here's what we normally do type of thing. And so, um, and also to your point, I, I do want to say that um, Ms. Edwards and um, Mr. Hollister did, um, specify that they would try to really target some of those um, populations that you know are less represented Absolutely. going forward and reach out to some of the groups that we used for um, the uh, anti-racist audit um, since we did get such a good representation it seemed like we had such a nice representation so they had mentioned doing that as well um, and um, you know, and, and keeping the survey open, which was, I think, you know, going to be a big, a big deal. So yeah, I, was, I just want to no, throw one more in. thing in there, um, and just for the community to think about too, as we devise a calendar, that the more we move the school year up, or to start earlier, that prior to school starting, there's pre-service week. I know we all know that, but then um, just thinking about, I think we talked about. Um, summer school and how a lot of our families are taking you know a lot more advantage of summer school that that does mean that a lot more staff is being used as well in less time so just just so many things to consider as we think about our calendar and we think about um, all of our stakeholders that will be impacted I just wanted to just mention that well thank you mr. Hollis miss Edwards how would you recommend proceeding if there are, if we, if someone such as myself had some suggestions of some alterations to make um, for for public um, interest? I mean, it can. I don't know if it becomes a fifth calendar. I know in years past, what we've done is put something together after hearing a little bit back from some of the community, and then. To um, Dr. McKnight's point, it would come back to policy committee, and then go back out for public comment, um, including that. So it would be a whole separate calendar. I, I'm, I'm open to however you all think is the appropriate way to proceed. So I, I'd like to share that I, I recommended earlier. We we let the community give them an opportunity to react to the conversation we've had today. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, we talked about this, and this was purposeful. Well, I said, you know, we talked about our transparent conversation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Joftis, we knew that if we bought for 10 <laughs> professional days <laughs> in our, okay. and I, <laughs> to be fair, I was not counting the pre-service, so we're not as far away as okay. I thought. Right. We're not Very as far good. away as we But count. we knew that that would be a strong reaction yeah. from our community. Mm -hmm. um, but we also want to honor the research, yeah. right? And, and um, so we said we would have the conversation we know we were starting out in some conservative ways, but we wanted to hear the perspective of our board members. Excellent point, bringing up some of the challenges because I think it was last year we heard loud and clear from our teachers who made the commitment to teach in summer school and provide that, that they needed a break before starting the year. Just trying to combine all of these interests together. Um, now, this is just maybe our first step of innovation. We still get the opportunity to build on this calendar and learn from what we implement next year and the following year. Um, and so I think we should look at this as a, as a multi-year process to be able to learn and make adjustments. And that's how I think we get to the point of true innovation that speaks to what our students need, what works for our families, and most importantly, looking at what the data says is yielding the results that we want. And while monitoring the fiscal impact of it all. 
Can I add just one more thing? That um, just for our community to take into consideration that, you know, each calendar year is a little different. Like this year is an election year, so what we may do in the next calendar, it may be a little bit difficult to do it in the next calendar. I just wanted to put that out there and say that before people make comments that we want consistency, but there may be years where we just can't do quite everything. So just to bear with us on that and keep that in mind. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, especially because there are at least three um, days religious observ days of religious observance that we generally try to do, like a non-instructional day, if possible, mm -hmm. um, that all fall on weekends, weekends. this year. So that will change, obviously, to Ms. Evans' point, moving, you know, the next year. Okay, yeah. so Mr. Kim, Mr. Kim. Yeah, sorry, I just... Um, while you bring that up, I wanted to raise a point to the rest of the board that I raised at our, our um, committee meeting last week that, you know, by the very nature of a, of a calendar, it's going to fluctuate every year. Um, while I, I do find that consistency and, and providing that consistency is important, I don't think that, um, I think that it's perhaps valuable to, to not sacrifice those, even if it's a one-year opportunity, to, to bring value to, to our community with, with new things um, for the sake of consistency. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Uh, maybe what we need to do is bring it back to the policy committee. Uh, wait a minute. Ms. Seabrook, you I'm wanted to Seabrook. provide yeah. some guidance so, yes. to us? So I just wanted to say that right now, the next policy committee meeting wasn't until December 8th. Mm -hmm. That it has to now be revised because of CUBE. Right. Um, oh, right. so, so we, we need a new forward. date for the policy meeting. The board meeting is December 6th. Right. So if you want to bring the, and, and the board is required by policy to pass this ca calendar adopted in December. Right. So if you, so you either can suspend policy IDA, suspend the timelines. Right. So that gives Which you more time. About. Or have a policy meeting in November. Which is which is jam packed, but we can find a date. We can we can find a date in November, and that so that to uh, Dr. McKnight so on that you can pass it by December. So, okay. what would you? I mean, do you need that extra time or? Um, yes. So that was my recommendation that we have a policy um, meeting in November, um, and it can even be just on one this one topic, even it, yeah. through Zoom, right? Yeah. That's you could do that. Yeah. Just as a thought. All right. So <laughs> there's, there's no requirement necessary to suspend the policy then right. at this time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very so, much. Hold on one second. Okay. So um, it has also been suggested to me that perhaps I um, talk to you about what um, some adjustments that I would be interested in having you all look at so that um, you can move forward with it from and go from there, if that's okay with everybody. <coughs> so one of the things, so what a... Basically, I'll just kind of put it all out there. Um, I was looking at if we moved, made the first day um, of school on the 17th, so the first day of um, the in-service or pre-service would be the 10th. Um, kept the I'm, I'm looking on scenario A, by the way, just okay. as a FYI. Um, making taking those two days that we just moved and adding um, the professional development days on the 15th and 16th um, of, of February. I'm sorry. Yes, of February. And then um, moving the last day to June 14th and putting in a non-instructional day on April 22nd. Mm -hmm. And that was all I had except for, I wasn't sure if you could just explain, um, on some of the calendars or previous calendars, there was an early release day on March 1st. We removed that, and I'm fine with that if there wasn't necessarily a reason for it to be there, because I know early release days are difficult in a lot of ways. And then my other question is, the early release day on May 9th, is that that day specifically for a reason, or is it could be moved to the 10th, so it is on a Friday, since we don't have other early release days, or many other early release days on Fridays. I can explore all those things. Um, I think uh, the early release day on the 9th was, 
I didn't might know if it be was interims, because of grades. Right. Yeah. But, okay. but depending on the count of the days, as we shift some of the other pieces, okay. it still may work out to be interims shifted the other way. I just have to oh, look actually, at the numbers. Oh, actually, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. Anyone else? Ms. Wolf, may I just close out and just thank the board? Um, I started by saying there is no perfect calendar. <laughs> But there is a process, I think, that we go through to try to find as close of a scenario um, and as close of a conversation and interest for everyone who's involved. So we do thank you for the discussion and really extending the thinking and the opportunities for the county. Thank you all so much. And yes, we thank you a lot, too, because this was quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And we'll look forward to your coming back. Yes, thank you. So at this time, we're going to go into recess, and we will be in recess until 6.55 p.m. Thank you.
Welcome back. We're now up to item number eight, so I will um, ask Mr. Hull to proceed. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Rob Riley, our Associate Superintendent of Finance, to come up. Um, and as Dr. Monifa McKnight returns, uh, she has some comments to kick us off, but I will just say, uh, she's getting settled here, that we're very excited uh, to come before you tonight to talk about the 2023-24 uh, uh, budget and the board's priorities around uh, the budget. Uh, you've all heard me say it before, uh, the budget is a reflection of our values. Uh, show me your budget and I'll tell you your priorities. And so it really is important that we're gaining the feedback um, of this group along with our community stakeholders, our superintendent, um, and we'll bring all of those together uh, as we proceed through the budget process and make sure that uh, those are reflected and aligned with the district's strategic plan. Uh, so with that, I will pass it over to Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Hall. So um, today we are going to spend some time talking about our uh, budget priorities. The budget season has arrived upon us shortly here, um, very quickly, and I think it's important for us to, as we just had a conversation around priorities related to the calendar, we do the same um, as we approach the budget season so that our community members can hear, you know, what we're thinking, how we're thinking, and most importantly, how it aligns to um, the priorities of the system. So before, um, we go into the conversation about the priorities. I did want to briefly review our current FY23 operating budget that the board adopted on um, June 7th of 2022. So the FY23 operating budget totals 2.92 billion and reflects a 137.9 million or 5% increase more than the previous fiscal year. Um, as you know, that was a record budget. We talked about a record budget for record times in which we were addressing many, many different needs. Um, and again, we were very appreciative for our county in understanding what those needs were. Um, and through much advocacy of our community members, we were able to successfully have a local contribution from Montgomery County, which was 86.4 million more than the minimum uh, amount required by the state maintenance of effort law. So we were, in fact, in a very good place last year um, in terms of where we were budget-wise. Um, on November 8th, 2021, the board uh, uh, approved the district strategic plan for FY 2022, extending all the way to FY 2025. And of course, there was much conversation around um, the strategic plan. The board strategic plan includes three budget, um, uh, three priority areas for the district that set the framework, I believe, for what we have been doing and our work moving forward. And I just want to remind us of those areas of the strategic framework. And it's one, academic excellence. Second, well-being and family engagement. And the third is professional and operational excellence. And so again, with that strategic plan extending all the way until 2025, we of course want to make sure that we have a chance to see that vision all the way through and take deep consideration of that um, with our budget. So I am um, recommending the following areas of interest as the starting point for today's discussion. These are the interests that we've heard um, and considered in our planning and look forward to building on what we do moving forward. So in our conversations of getting much input from community members, engaging in conversation um, with board members about what some of your interests were, <clears throat> those areas are that we'll be addressing critical staffing shortages across the district, as well as ensure that we're hiring quality principals and teachers in, in our schools and in our classrooms. Second, leveraging the findings and recommendations of the anti-racist audit. I remember last year we had much conversation around how that was going to be a part of what we wanted to support last year and continue to do that. And we know that a big part of the anti-racist audit is gonna require that we enhance professional development for all of our staff. <clears throat> The third is increasing the number of full-day pre-kindergarten slots while expanding pre-kindergarten classes across the county. Another area that I want to highlight is the area of innovation from the Maryland Blueprint. We're excited to continue to extend those opportunity, having many conversations about space <clears throat> and how space is going to help us accommodate that, and we're going to well, we're going to need much space to accommodate that growth and working with many partners to do that. So I wanted to I was happy that that still remained on our list of priorities. Um, next, examining the state of special education staffing, including paraeducator positions and differentiated pay for those employees. Um, the next was expanding awareness and access to career pathways for employees. 
and grow your own program. Again, a conversation we've had and we've been planning and, and having a couple, you know, many opportunities to try some different things uh, that we know will ultimately solve our problem of many of the staffing shortages that we've experienced because of COVID-19, but that we need to get ahead of in many areas um, within our educational infrastructure. And then the final was continuing investments in school security so that students have a safe and secure learning environment and so that they are able to focus on their learning and instruction. So I want to share those six areas with you um, because that, that really reflects many of the priorities we've heard in many different spaces moving forward. I am going to be presenting a framework to you on December 6th in which I'll uh, share some, some things around that framework that should really have us um, help visualize what the overall budget that is presented to the board encompassing um, and how that would reflect the priorities that I just shared um, and any others that you may share that are going to be important to help move the system forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, Mr. Riley Weave and, and we'll engage in, in more conversation from there. Uh, thank you, Dr. McKnight. Good evening, President Wolf, Vice President Silvestri, and other board members. Uh, to, so tonight we are going to be continuing the work of developing our FY24 budget, um, and specifically want to, we want to hear uh, from you and your priorities for the next budget. Um, there's a PowerPoint. If not, I can kind of talk us through it. I think they're working on it. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so the start of the budget development begins with the board's strategic plan, which is a four-year plan that identifies your objectives, targets, or metrics of success, and strategies to obtain these objectives. And as Dr. McKnight mentioned, the objectives are organized by our three priority areas, including academic excellence, well-being and family support, and professional and operational excellence. Uh, so the board's strategic plan is the basis for budget development, but then we incorporate um, input from our stakeholders. So in addition to input from Dr. McKnight and what we'll hear from you all this morning, we also get input for, from our very informed and committed budget advisory committee. So this committee is comprised of leaders from MCPS, our community, associations, and PTAs. And this year we are 50 members strong, including 10 student members whose insight have had a great impact on the work of the committee. So at, uh, uh, next slide. Yeah, there we go. So after gathering input from the work of uh, the work of the finance and budget team is to align our district priorities with our financial resources. Easier said than done. So al al although our state, federal, and local revenue sources have increased over the last few years, resources are limited. And this is why, in addition to being a priority-driven budget, it is also a data-driven budget, because we can't do everything. So we must look to uh, solutions that uh, meet student needs and are effective. Um, ESSA provided some resources outside our normal funding, and they continue to do that, but that funding ends on 9-30-2024. Another driver in recent years, as we've been talking about this evening, is our blueprint funding. So much of the work that the board did over the summer regarding your priorities aligned with blueprint, um, and these priorities that you came, came up with are improving math and literacy rates, improving the recruitment, retention, and distribution uh, of a high quality and diverse work staff, supporting two-way communications between schools and families, and building a safe and inclusive school climate. So based on that and additional conversations we've heard thus far, uh, you've delineated your goals uh, to some common themes uh, which appear on the next uh, slide and which uh, Dr. McKnight um, actually went through. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So I, I won't repeat them, but, but there they are, and, and that's what um, was the further delineation of those summer goals. So I'm gonna pass it back to you, President Wolf, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you and the board members on your priorities. Well, thank you. I um, was looking at the common themes and I'm glad to see that a number of the things that I was really interested in are there, which were staffing, the anti-racist audit, expanding pre-K and school <laughs> security. And I think all of those align nicely with the strategic plan. The school security goes into community and well-being, communication and well-being. Uh, expanding pre-K, of course, is academic excellence, uh, staffing, academic excellence and operational excellence. And um, 
I think, did I cover all four of mine? Those were my four, so I, they, they align nicely with the strategic plan. So I'm really glad to see that they, they made it into consideration. And I look forward to hearing what some of my fellow board members say, because since they're common themes, I think we had an awful lot of overlap here. So uh, Dr. Joftis, I'm just going to go around this way, just come straight down. Thank you, go President ahead. Wolf. And yes, I agree. I think these are, uh, I think you guys did a great job of <clears throat> identifying common themes across all of us. I do want to raise, I know you all know this, um, just the issue that I have about making sure in addition to funding our priorities that we also are gaining a better understanding of our current spending. Um, because uh, Mr. Riley, as you said, and Dr. McKnight, as you said, we're not always going to have such big increases in our budgets and really understanding where our money's going, what's working, what's not working, both in terms of how we're um, deploying our staff and what programs we're using is really critical. Um, and uh, Mr. Hall, I know you're deep in the process and, and Dr. Murphy deep in the process of doing that work, which I really, really appreciate. Um, but adding priorities on top of things speaks against kind of what I've been trying to convey about this idea of coherence. We can't keep overlaying things on top of one another um, without making some pretty significant changes based on a very clear strategy of what we're trying to, um, of what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm glad that we're able to at least begin that work. Um, and hopefully we can get that going pretty far along this year. I know we won't finish it prior to this uh, budget, but Hopefully, we can make a lot of progress along that way. So, thank you for that. Ms. Evans, do you want to speak? Oh, sure. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't see the direction you went around, so I didn't know. <laughs> I'm, just, going I'm, I'm yeah. just coming straight so down. The I line. missed that. No, um, always a great opportunity for um, us as individual board members to um, talk about what our collective um, interests are, as well as um, some other thoughts that we might have. So, what jumps out at me that I probably say every year is um, happy about the legislation that we have at the state level. I run the blueprint for Maryland, so the expansion of pre-kindergarten classes. Um, we help our students out. We give them a, a level playing field in, from the very beginning. And um, we heard today, and I, I hope I don't pronounce her last name correctly, incorrectly, um, um, Ms. Heather um, Yohannik, yes, she came today to talk about the work that they're already doing with the staff development teachers, but just really the anti-racist audit just pointed out how we needed to definitely be um, uh, strategic and systematic in our approach, and so I just wanted to highlight that. It's definitely something that is really important to me, and then um, expanding awareness and access to career pathways. We had a really great conversation with um, SEIU uh, recently, and then just being able to go into our schools and just see what's happening in action, how our um, principals are able to see individuals that have um, stepped up to the plate, our paraeducators. Um, we had, um, during COVID, why is it escaping me? We, um, how did we label the people that were coming to the schools helping out? Um, Monitors. monitors, yes, 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 yes. How they've been creative in, in helping our monitors to come up with a pathway to be able to get um, their certifications and go back to school. So I just really wanted to highlight that. And then I'm just going to add like one or two of my own where um, I do think in the area of retention, it will, it would bode well to really think about um, being able to help our uh, assistant um, principal administrators become assistant principals, right? We, we, there are oftentimes more things that we could have our APs do than our ASAs. So I just wanted to put that out there. But definitely what stands out here is what's really important in how we move our system forward and what we've discussed as priorities as a whole. Thank you. Dr. Daka? I don't have you don't have anything to add? Ms. Silvestri, do you? Yeah. Um, yeah, these are these are great. Um, I'm, I'm in agreement with these. Um, my question was because critical addressing critical staffing shortages is so important. 
um, where do you see the where do you see that there funding needed in order to what are we going to put money into to address the critical staffing shortage is my question um, and then the second part of that I think is related to uh, identifying incentives financial incentives and other incentives uh, in uh, liberty to bring your team along to 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 get high quality principals to uh, Title One schools. So um, I, I I want us to focus on critical staffing shortages. I'm just not clear what is it that we need to fund in order to address that problem. So a part of this, <clears throat> excuse me, a part of this work is um, us you know, first getting the priorities and then coming back and doing some research and, and bringing forward a proposal, you know, in the budget release to share here are the key areas that we find, um, you know, and working with the board alongside that process, here are the key leverage points that we've seen that help to help us make movement in these areas. And this is what we recommend to the, to the board that we invest in to make change in these areas. It is through our work sessions that we can continue to have more conversation, even deeper conversation, about why we believe those are the right levers that we should invest in as it relates to these broad themes that will um, have us either continue or make adjustments. So I think we include that as a part of the process. Okay, so you'll come back with us to what the details yes. of that, what that will entail. Thank yes, you. right now these are just the themes that we've seen as areas that we need to make an impact in in the system for further um, prosperous operations <laughs> um, and think that those are going to be high leverage points for us to continue to study as it relates to budget. Okay. Um, the second point is um, the paraeducator differential pay. That's also negotiated, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we can have the intent, but we have to negotiate that and uh, I'm in full agreement I mean it's not mm -hmm. not all para positions are created equal and I think that we should compensate those that have uh, more I don't know what to call it but an assignment that is um, you know, different level than yeah. other assignments Great. and finally um, the career pathways grow your own no surprise I fully support <laughs> this one and um, you know, I, I really want our students to, every student in the system, to know that the Future Educators Program exists. We did a soft launch this year of 14, 15 students. But this year we should be seeing posters in every school, communication campaigns. I don't know if we need more money for that, but it's, maybe we use existing resources, but definitely a communications campaign for that or our students. I know we've talked about finding ways to help them pay for their education. That's not necessarily going to be coming out of our budget, but maybe there's something that needs to be done with the foundation in order to activate that. Um, too often we hear of teachers and educators saying that it's hard to get tuition reimbursement, so is there something that we could invest in there to make that process more efficient and seamless because we need them to get continue their education? Um, yeah, so I, I think that there's... Um, I really truly believe in this strategy in order to address the first bullet, the staffing shortages. And so whatever we can do with existing funding or repurposing or additional dollars, um, we cannot operate our school system without the talented staff that our students deserve. So I really, really want to focus on that one. And finally, uh, safety and security. Um, I know that we invested in the rovers for the elementary school last year, Rovers for last year, I think we heard from um, some of our school leaders that that could be tightened up a little bit uh, when we met with McCap uh, recently, um, just better understanding of their roles and responsibilities, where they were going to be, just a more an efficient use of the mm -hmm. resource. Um, but um, when we decided to invest in elementary, I, I think I asked the question, have we done a, a full assessment that tells us that elementary is where it's needed? Um, and I'm assuming that's the case, but I wondered if, mm -hmm. if that's how the decision was made? Yes. Or so, are there other points that we need to look at this year? Right. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I want to clarify the, the role of the rovers is actually to be able to support more of a cluster model. Um, they, they were to be able to expand support to elementary school, but it wasn't just for elementary school. And we wanted to have our own internal security staff that was able to build relationships with schools, but that would also be the same staff would need to intervene if there was a problem, whether it may be a problem within the community or um, some, some particular type of conflict that existed. So it was to be able to expand the model beyond just previously we had the SRO model and then the CEO model that was focused on high school. But we were moving towards a whole cluster model, so that was it. Now, we did invest in that in last year's budget, but remember, we didn't implement it until uh, the start of the year or the summer, quite frankly. Um, and so, yes, a big part of what they are doing is studying that model and learning from it. And I mean, the information that we get from our elementary schools and others that tell us, you know, how it's working and some of the benefits of it and some things that we need to look at to make adjustments, we will absolutely do so. I will say, though, it has been. Um, you know, there are things that we're going to learn to improve that process, but I do know that it's been um, positively received that there is more of a resource that is available to um, larger numbers of our students um, in schools through that process of having rovers. And they're everywhere. I mean, as we go out and visit, I mean, it's, it's actually been really nice to see them taking on responsibility of different things that we're trying to do as a system and, um, and doing it within their cluster so that they can focus on building those relationships. Yeah. I just wanted to share that we heard from MCAP members that they needed to better understand the role. Yep. Uh, okay. And anything that's new that didn't exist before, mm -hmm. you know, that it, yeah, it yeah. takes some time. Yeah, so I, I, look, I really look forward to seeing um, what you all come back with in terms of safety and security <coughs> after a full assessment of what we have and what is needed um, so that we can make informed decisions on, in the budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, as a as a follow up, can we ask Mr. Hull? That's something that we can bring back and make sure that um, at the end of this year we can bring back to the board an assessment overall. But we'll just make note of that and work with the board. I, I just want to follow up because when I was interested in school security, I was interested in cameras at mm -hmm. the elementary schools. Me too. Number one and number two infrastructure at the high schools so that uh, walkie-talkies, phones, and things work inside the mm -hmm. building should we ever need that mm -hmm. again. I mean, yes, I, I think the rovers are good, and I would like a report on that, but I'm, I'm talking about the yep. stuff that yeah, supports them. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, that's, what I, that, that's that. because we were supposed to be hearing some more about that. I can't remember when from... Um, I can say Ed. I can't think of Ed's last name. Clark. Clark. Yeah, Ed Clark. Clark. But I, I don't know when we're supposed to be getting that. But I think that's really important because we've yeah. heard people can't, they can't communicate with each other in the school. I mean, you can't communicate in this building really, really well. Right. So I think we have a lot of infrastructure yeah. things to look at. Thank you. Uh, and I know we only have so much money, so I'm waiting <laughs> to hear how you're going to, to work with that. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I think a lot of what I would want to say has been said, so I don't need to fully go into it all. I, too, was thinking of, with the safety and security more about cameras and those type of things with um, addressing critical staffing shortages and needs, um, you know, looking at whether it's, you know, qual areas of things we can do to s support a better quality of work-life balance for s or stipends for those, you know, increased stipends to be put in whatever area that we need. I felt like those things were all important, but I guess they're kind of sub sections of, but for me, um, you know, you and I've met a couple times now and um, had conversations about, you know, my biggest thing is being able to see some of the returns on our current investments and really trying to do a strong program analysis, including different contracts and organizing them into a way that we can see like in one clump, what we're, where our money's going, and then the um, analysis of our human capital and um, where we're putting our money, um, trying to address the fact that um, if it were, I'd like to see us be among the top of school systems um, as an employer. As, um, and so, um, but I feel like this is a, a good foundation to 
be able to break down all of the other aspects of what we'd like to see as individual board members and as um, individual schools and, and needs go. So thank you for the work, and I look forward to seeing what your recommendations are. But I do look forward to getting the analysis. We had talked about maybe some sort of analysis before the full budget comes in. Yeah, and we had uh, said from the beginning of last year, too, that a program budget is going to be a great tool for you guys because um, that's something that the public had said, too, right? The way our, our budget is aligned right now by departments and divisions, um, it doesn't necessarily speak to some of the things that we're talking about now, effectiveness of certain programs. And that's the work that um, Dr. Murphy and Mr. Hull and myself are working on with, with, every, with all the... Great. all the system to kind of determine what those programs are going to be. So there's a lot of decisions to be made, yeah. um, and we want to look at the funding for those programs and the effectiveness. So yeah. that's I just, work going on. So You know, we've all kind of said, and I know you all say the same thing, there's only so much money, and um, so just trying to figure out how we can better utilize what we've got um, could be helpful. So thank you for that. I'll look forward to it. Ms. Harris? Uh, thank you. I would, um, I think my biggest priority um, looking at our operating budget this year um, is, is, is more philo philosophical, I think, and it goes along the lines with do what Dr. Joftis was saying and, and what Ms. Mandrowski was saying is wanting to see a really clear through line between what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we are implementing it with fidelity, true fidelity. Um, What's, you know, how are we formatively evaluating that work so we don't wait till the end to say, oh, it was good or oh, maybe not. But also, how we're get, we're going to measure that impact, know it's working, and then if it's if if it's not, you know, acknowledging that openly and and moving. And I see a couple of areas of work that we've committed to very strongly this year that could form sort of the structure of some of those through lines. One of which is the anti-racist audit. And the other is our aggressive new sustainability policy, both of which are going to have to take incredibly intentional work and be reflected in almost everything that we do, almost every dollar that we spend. Um, and I think um, I would also, just as a, as a pragmatic thing, really like to continue to see that um, we, we're, we are highlighting, and maybe what I mean is actually highlighting, um, the things in this in this um, FY24 budget that are ESSER dependent. So we really are keeping our focus on the things that we've got to be determining. Is this going to be a one-time, one-and-done, or are we going to need to be looking for ways in our budget to continue those programs, that, that staffing, whatever it is, once that money goes away? Um, and just another, I, I um, echo so, what so many of my colleagues have said about our kind of are growing our own, but I have a very strong specific interest in ways that we are making, I mean, the, the dynamic, talented, truly diverse 21st century workforce that this school system needs is in our classrooms right now. And we still, I don't think, are really making all of our students see a future for themselves in the school system if they want one. Um, because we do hire accountants and you know nutritionists and and chefs and financial analysts and you know all you know lots of, of of careers lots of professions that you know you don't necessarily immediately think of when you think about uh, i'm going to work for the for for the school system and so as we we are more expansive in how we encourage students to think about us as perhaps their future employer and i have to say you know i have to put in a plug too for being a destination employer for cte instructors because i was sort of struck when i was one that um, in some ways the system seemed to look at me as fungible goods but you lose somebody that taught my class and we struggle to find somebody to fill those roles and you see that as a as a real constant when you look at our various areas of, of CTE education is is the, it is very hard to find and it's very hard to replace um, those educators and so one focus also could be encouraging our current CTE students who intend to build a profession around the the training and the and the academics and the licensure and the certification they're getting in their program, go out, build your career, but then come back and teach this. Um, because that, again, is, is, an, is an ongoing, hard-to-fill need. And I think 
maybe it doesn't get the kind of attention that a lot of our other staffing challenges do because writ large inside the school system, it's a, it's a small group that are teaching those hardcore CTE programs. But um, they are incredibly important and increasingly important as we grow this priority, but also hard to find. So, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Kim? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I, I think, um, again, looking at our programming and really understanding um, what that looks like is really uh, critical. Um, you know, that goes for our magnet programs and, and the virtual academy. It's not even necessarily a, a reinvestment, but just being deliberate and, and providing those programs with the, uh, you know, understanding them and providing them with the attention and care they deserve um, are really central to, of course, improving math and literacy, uh, of course, expanding educational opportunities, but also to really uh, use that as a way to address the inequities we see uh, across the district. Um, you know, those magnet programs, I, I think, have the potential with the right care to, to be a great uh, avenue to do so, both in the uh, STEM and the humanities. Uh, and same goes for the tutoring programs. Uh, I think it's another uh, area that, if we really understand it, it also has the potential to um, address some of those concerns that we see. Uh, as far as building safe and inclusive schools goes, uh, of course, increasing security does include making sure that there's cameras in our hallways and locks on our doors uh, and mental health support. It's, it's, it's of course, another area. Uh, I'm eager to hear more about um, what investment was made, I think, last year into, you know, as we talk about alleviating the workload of, of those people uh, who are in our schools, directly supporting our students face-to-face, one-on-one. Um, I, I, I'm eager to hear more and learn more about uh, how we've invested in for 504 personnel, uh, making sure that, uh, again, that case that takes away from the caseload of, the, of those people supporting our students um, and seeing how that can be reflected as an investment. Um, we heard earlier today about uh, looking into, um, and now we're at the point of looking into a specific, specific contracts for um, te technology uh, around communication. Um, again, uh, so glad to see that um, our investment is reflecting that need that we've continually heard um, a, a, as a need of our community. Um, so again, those services are, are crucial. Uh, as far as recruitment and retention go, uh, of course there's an importance of grow your own models, uh, uh, as was already said. Um, the only way to have a workforce that truly is reflective of our student population is if it comes from that student population itself. Um, so of course the, the um, future educators uh, program and, and you know, even so, things as simple as internships or, or teacher's assistance, all ways that, that we can continue that pattern and, and see those results. Uh, and the last thing around this area, uh, continuing to invest in teacher choice models. Uh, this pilot that we're seeing around technology, I think, um, is such a great example of a way that we can listen to the people who are in our classrooms every day. Uh, I, see, I think applying that principle not only to technology, but to general instructional resources, even practices of the district, um, is just another strategy to, to um, improve retention. So, uh, thank you. Dr. Daka, you wanted to say something? Yes, I know. I, I wasn't ready before, but um, I just wanted to mention that a, a great school system or a great anything is measured by how well it does with its least able persons. And I didn't hear anything about that uh, as we went around the table. I'm still concerned about African American and Latino students specifically because if we are going to be a successful school system, we need to be successful with everyone. Otherwise, you know, we're not, we, we, people do say we're successful, but we know that underneath that this is a problem that we really have. And there wasn't too much to be said about anti-racist audit, but if we don't put some figures on that, uh, and I think Dr. Williams must have said this, or I read this, no, I read this on page 10, what you monitor gets done. And if we don't monitor that, it's not gonna happen. And I know I had a conversation just recently with Miss um, Hazel about all the recommendations that had to do with curriculum, and they are now working on that very diligently because that is really one of the very important parts of the um, anti-racist audit, in addition to hiring and retaining, and you've all mentioned that. So I just wanted to keep that uh, in your minds because, um, well, this is my chance to do it. Now, I also sent notes to some folks here. 
about the budget and about negotiations. And I've been here a long time, so we've gone through the budget before, but it really works well, in my mind, when the board knows how much things cost. Mm -hmm. So I did ask about, okay, if we added two stipends to every secondary school, what would be the average cost? And if we uh, added some planning time in the elementary school, what would that cost? And class coverage uh, was $55. Uh, I don't think we're doing that anymore, or, or we're saying we may not be able to. But maybe after a teacher covers twice, the third time, it would be $55, because we are hearing from teachers that they still have to do that kind of thing. And we heard, um, I don't know whether everybody heard this, but from McBoa, they want career pathways. They feel that they are supervisors, they're managers, mm -hmm. and they want to be considered for other jobs. You know, if they're doing something, uh, like if they're doing transportation, could they be managers somewhere else? Could they be supervisors somewhere else? But they feel that they've been cut off. So these are just some of the things that we picked up when we were meeting with MCEA and MCAP. And I think these are things to look at. Now, if we know how much things cost, when we talk with our associations, we can say, well, this is how many teachers you're not going to be able to have if you do this. I don't know. I just think that's going to make an impression. I really do. So that's why I'm throwing it out there, and that's why I wrote to people. And I'll write to everybody else about it if you didn't get it. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daka. Does anybody else have anything? You know, this idea of program evaluation comes up, and it's very important to me because I just want to sort of tack on to Judy about the lowest in the system. You know, we're running a tutoring program, and I'm getting a, a lot of feedback that the implementation of that program is very inconsistent. And so I would like, if it's going to come up to be refunded, some idea that you've talked to people and figured out what adjustments might need to be made because where I'm hearing that the implementation is inconsistent are the very kids that we need to be impacting. Um, and this is not, sometimes they're saying it's not available to them. What I suspect is more so that they don't know about what's available to them. But I really would like somebody to be able to talk about that if you come back and include tutoring in the budget, because I think that's very important. Yes. It, would it make sense to add a theme? Um, I mean, a lot of us have sort of talked about <laughs> continuous improvement, performance management, program evaluation. That I mean, that, if we don't have the staff right now to do that, that, that it does have budget implications. Um, I know Dr. Addison's um, shop does a lot of that, but I also know they're working very hard with what we're currently doing. So I don't know if we need to add another theme if we all agree to that. Rebecca. I just wanted to touch on one little thing. Um, way back when uh, Dr. Zuckerman and I had started talking about the grow your own um, teachers pathway things. You know, one of the things that I brought up was the students that I speak to, particularly the ones in like some of the after school programs like Liberty's <laughs> Promise and whatever, when they talk about wanting to be a teacher but not being able to afford to go to school and I, um, to college. And, um, you know, I had originally mentioned this in reference to having had a niece who went to Mount St. Mary's and they used to have a program where your college was paid for and then you would get assigned somewhere in the state of Maryland and you worked off the, the debt essentially. So if you stayed a certain number of years, it was covered and if not. But um, I don't know if we're still looking at any of those kind of things or if colleges are doing that sort of thing. But I do think it's something we might want to pursue and just in terms of trying to help because even with the payback for um, educational, continued education for our current staff members that are having trouble, if it would, seems like it might be a better fit to pay up front and have it worked back as opposed to the other way around. Because if you don't have the money to go in the first place, it doesn't really matter whether you get the money back or not because you can't afford to go. 
Thank you. And you know, my final thought, and I don't know how to necessarily phrase this, so hear what I'm trying to say and maybe you educators can translate it. But in the blueprint, it takes you from pre-K all the way through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that in our program. Mm -hmm. In other words, the high schools ought to be able to tell the middle schools what you're not sending us that we need for our kids to better succeed. And the middle school should be able to tell the elementary schools what's not working, what the kids are not, what skill they're not coming with to be successful. So I'm looking for like that, that pre-K thread all the way through. I want to say to universities of Shady Grove or whatever university you choose to go to, but I, I'm perfectly willing at the moment to stop at Montgomery College. <laughs> I think but that's no, our next presentation. Yeah, right? but I, I just, yeah, and I, but I do think it's important for when we're thinking about the budget to think about investment that gets our kids all the way through the system, so, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I just wanted to say that Ms. Wolf's not off the beaten path there because we used to do that. I think they called it articulation. Vertical yeah. articulation. Is that what it is? Vertical okay. articulation. So when I it was middle school, they would bring the <laughs> fifth graders' records and attitudes and all to us and let us know what we needed to work with, and then we did the same for the high school. So, yeah, maybe we should go back to that. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to add? Well, can, want to thank can you. I, I'm sorry, ahead, can I Mr. just uh, say sure. a few things as we close out here? Sure. Um, so thank you, first of all, this was really helpful. Um, I know Mr. Riley, myself, uh, the superintendent, and uh, Dr. Murphy uh, appreciate hearing this, um, especially the theme around really needing to be strategic about what we're investing in, what, where we currently have our dollars, uh, and what's working and what's not. So that's really important because there is limited dollars. There's not enough uh, money to do everything. But equally as important is there's not enough time. So if we're investing, uh, you know, an hour of the day with something that is not effective for our students, that's a waste uh, of, of time that could have gone and been invested in something that is effective. And so it really is important that we're looking at that, making sure that our budget uh, is aligned with the programs um, that we're hearing from Dr. Murphy and his staff are effective in moving the needle for students. Um, and I also wanted to touch on the security piece. Uh, as Dr. McKnight noted, uh, the Elementary Rovers is a new program and something that we are uh, monitoring as we implement it and looking for opportunities to improve that. Um, we're also looking for opportunities uh, where we can invest in the security cameras that we talked about. Um, and again, funding is uh, a limitation there, but our security team has actually done a great job of uh, identifying, applying for, and receiving some grants. Uh, and so that's where the majority of the money for the security cameras currently is coming from. It's actually not the operating budget. It's, it's from some of these grants that they have gone out and identified. Uh, so, you know, kudos to that team for that. Um, and then back to the evaluation piece specifically around, you know, the ESSER funds. I, I heard that come up a couple of times. And so we've had um, at least one or two meetings already, and we've got another one scheduled in the next couple of weeks uh, to talk about where we have evaluations around some of these, the big programs. Of course, we can't evaluate everything, so we focus on, on the biggest ones. Um, and so we will have data to bring back to this group and, and of course, look at internally uh, this spring and summer as we uh, 12 months from now, we'll be, prepare, be preparing the first budget in many years without ESSER. And so having that data will be really important as we, um, as we do that. And then finally, just touching on the equity piece, uh, this is something that uh, is, strikes close to, to my heart, uh, making sure that, and I think Dr. Daka said it very well, I mean, it, an organization is, can be judged on how it's serving its most vulnerable um, and I think less able was the word uh, that was used, but to, to making sure that all of our students, and that's what equity is, is that we're meeting all of our students where they are and meeting their needs. And those needs are different for all of our students. And so making sure that we're doing that on a systemic, district-wide uh, basis to make sure that we are putting our resources uh, where they're needed to uh, benefit our most vulnerable learners. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Thank you, all. Thank you Mr. Hall. Actually, just uh, to kind of add on to that last point, I, I think that after. as kind of a mindset, you know, equity shouldn't be the separate pool that you pour money to that, that you know, this much money is for academic excellence, this one's for operational excellence, and this one's for equitable education. 
our academic excellence and operational excellence should be ingrained and based around equity. Uh, that's ultimately the work uh, of public schools, of public education, to provide opportunities uh, to everyone. That understanding that you know people from all walks of life, um, regardless of what they look like or where they come from, deserve a high quality education. So uh, I think the most appropriate way to frame that thinking is to make sure that all of our efforts reflect equity. Thank you. And if I'm looking this way, and I think I'm at the end and you want to say something, just say it because I don't see your light if I'm looking this way, you know. Okay. Uh, all right, now we're up to item number nine, Dr. McKnight. All right, thank you, Ms. Wolf. I'm going to ask the team for the next presentation on college, career, and community readiness to join me at the table. Um, so I'm pleased to be joined by the members of the MCPS team uh, who will provide a follow-up to the May strategic planning meeting and in efforts to really define how in MCPS we are designing how we look at our programs, um, how we're being compliant to the vision of the blueprint, and making sure that our students are college, career, and community ready um, as the responsibility. The team is going to share how the Maryland Blueprint legislation is impacting that work. I feel like that's been a theme in all of our conversation tonight, the blueprint. So I'm so glad that they, you know, we're kind of bringing the finale of the presentations together to elevate that from the blueprint. And the presentation is also going to fit clearly in the context of the board's strategic plan around academic excellence. And as our student uh, member of the board just shared, centered in equity. So you're going to hear about those enhancements and um, what's being done at the secondary level to provide a robust student experience to explore um, their interests and most importantly, life beyond graduation. Um, I'm going to just end with that. I know that's something that's been important to me in my tenure to be able to work on making sure that we look at what is happening with our students when they leave us. Um, and I think being able to look at that speaks to everything that we're doing before in the K-12 structure. So not just having them graduate and then that's the end of their story in MCPS, but really working with our partners to have a better understanding of, um, you know, what is happening with them? Where are they going for employment if they're going right into careers? Is it our internships that we're providing that provides a next step opportunity for them to do that? If they're going to college, are they finishing? Are they coming back um, to Montgomery County? So those types of things to help um, us know better and understand the implications of what we're doing in the K-12 structure. So with that, thank you for joining us at the table and I will turn it over to Dr. Pew. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Nice to see all of you again this evening. Um, if we could move ahead uh, to the next three slides, you can go fairly quickly. Those are the board's priorities in the alignment of today. <laughs> next slide. Uh, this is the context of the meetings that we are coming to you and to show you the through line of how we're working um, to respond to the essential questions. Next slide. And so uh, a brief overview for today's uh, uh, presentation to you. Obviously, we want to show you how what we're working on and what's been discussed in, in the uh, strategic planning meetings is aligned with the academic excellence pillar. We want to talk about the blueprint for Maryland's future and the um, guidance that has come down from the AI, uh, the um, Accountability Implementation Board, as well as the Maryland State Department of Education, our interpretation of this, and then how we uh, hope to exceed what's listed in there. Um, and then also talking about the changes that are that are inherent from the legislation that are going to impact how we measure what is called college and career ready at the state, um, which is in alignment with your college and career ready and community ready. We are also going to share some data around your three-year trends for those post-college career ready measurements. And then talk about what we're doing this year to really address some of the things that have already been mentioned tonight about making sure that we have alignment and that we have program evaluation and that we're monitoring it throughout the year. Also talking about the, the metrics that will be used to measure progress towards uh, those goals and then bring to you some next steps and some future considerations for your discussion. Next slide. So here's the alignment. These are the specific ob objectives that we hope to meet tonight through the presentation. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Floyd, who will provide context specifically on the Maryland Blueprint. 
Good evening, board members. I am Genevieve Floyd, and I supervise career and post-secondary partnerships. And if you could please move to the next slide. Yes. Blueprint for Maryland's Future, that is a massive legislation, but of course at its core is the goal of ensuring that all of our students across the state graduate with the skills and the knowledge needed to succeed in a first year community college, college credit, credit bearing course without the need for remediation. What you see here are very high level components of the Blueprint Pillar 3, College Career Readiness, focused on standards and assessments. Previously, we were to assess our students at the end of grade 11. As of FY 2022, we are now required to assess them for college career readiness at the end of grade 10. Currently, we have interim standards in place to use to assess our students while the, study, while the state engages with an organization to do an empirical study to determine what are the skills, what are the knowledge base that the students should have in order to be successful. It is expected that in 2024, that study will be presented to the state and the state will receive recommendations. And then also in 2024, they, the state, will determine new scores, new measures that align to the new CCR standards. When students are deemed college career ready, we are to ensure that they are provided what's called a post-CCR pathway. And this includes advanced placement courses, international baccalaureate courses, um, career and technical education programs of study, and dual enrollment opportunities, our jumpstart to college, middle college, early college opportunities, at no cost starting in 2024, at no cost. If they are deemed not to be college and career ready, we are to continue to provide intervention, interventions and support pathways to ensure that before they graduate high school, they are in fact college and career ready. The state is going to look at or to examine the curriculum framework K through 12 to make sure that they revise the curriculum as needed and there is coherence and alignments with the new standards as appropriate. So by the time students get to grade 10, grade 12, they are able to assess college and career ready. It is expected that that work will be completed in 2025. Next slide, please. So on the left side of the screen, you see the previous measures that we use to assess the readiness of our students. And these measures were put in place after the passage of the College Career Readiness and College Completion Act of 2013. And they were designed in agreement or through an MOU with our um, state associations, the Maryland Association of Community Colleges, MAC, and the Public School Superintendents Association of Maryland, PAZAM. So these are the scores or the measures that were previously used to assess college readiness and reported, we reported that data to you as appropriate. I will share parenthetically that these measures continue to be used to provide students access to college credit courses without the need for remediation. Although they are not currently being accepted as the college career readiness measures as the, per the state. What's on the right side of the screen are the interim measures that are being accepted from the state to deem our students college or career ready. Next slide, please. So I shared with you that we are to ensure that our students have a post-CCR pathway. We have consistently provided opportunities for our students to enroll in AP courses, IB courses, college courses, dual enrollment courses. But since these pathways have been elevated, in Blueprint, we thought it appropriate to share with you some trend data. This is not all new data. Much of, you, of it you have seen before, so I won't linger on the slides, but we did believe it was appropriate to share with you the trends as, again at this point. So what you see now are the performance and the participation measures for students who are taking the AP or the IB exams. You can see from the trend data that the Data has remained relatively stable throughout the pandemic as it relates to participation and performance. And when you look closer at the demographics, you can see that the disproportionality of our students and our focus groups persist, as will our efforts in aggressively addressing this. Next slide, please. 
Dual enrollment is also on the rise. This slide presents the number of unique students who are enrolling as well as the course enrollments. You can see over time more students are opting to take college courses. In the school year 2020-2021, there was a spike at the height of the pandemic. More students were opting to take college courses virtually. And enrollments over the same time period have almost, no, they're more than doubled as it relates to the number of courses students are participating in. And we expect this trend will probably continue. Next slide, please. Looking at the demographics for the dually enrolled students, we see that our Asian and our black students are enrolling at a comparable rate and an increasing rate, while the enrollment of our Hispanic students and our white students are decreasing. However, when we look at the service groups, farm, special ed, and ESOL students, those rates are increasing across the board. Next slide, please. Career and technical education is also experiencing an increase in enrollment. This slide actually depicts the number of concentrators in the programs of study. So concentrators are students who persist beyond the halfway point in a select program of study. So more students are persisting and are staying involved in our CTE programs of study. You also see data there related to industry certification. And that was important to pull out because it too is elevated in the blueprint legislation. Next slide, please. The demographics with our CTE programs, they vary. They vary. However, we did notice as a team that when we looked at the Hispanic enrollment, our students are, it's decreasing. Same as with the dual enrollment population, same as with the AP and IB participation and performance. So we definitely are taking a closer look at that trend. Next slide, please. We recognize that we have to do more than what the state requires us as it relates to ensuring that our students are college, career, and community ready. And that includes tapping into the experiences that we provide our students, not only inside the classroom, but outside of the classroom. This visual actually is an artifact from a work group that was done and that was completed in 2019 where we looked at the varied experiences that exist across the district. And they are many. This is not by any means an exhaustive list. So much is happening at the school-based level. The unique experiences that our staff are providing our students, they are many. But we did want a visual to capture what's happening at a very broad level at each level and something that every student can have the opportunity to participate in regardless of what school they attend. We were very intentional about using the staircase to represent these experiences as it, it's indicative of experiences building upon one another and it also represents growth and ascension if you will but also the opportunity to descend and to re-engage at any level. So although, for example, career day is listed at elementary school, it does not discount the fact that it won't happen at middle school or high school or beyond. So this and the blending of the colors also indicates a re-engagement opportunity for students if they so choose. Just want to thank our colleagues in EGPS for helping to help us visualize this, the work that we do around experiences for our students. And it's pretty. <laughs> Next slide, please. So you may have noted on, on the previous slide, one of the experiences that our students have the opportunity to participate in is apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is also highlighted in the blueprint legislation. I noted earlier the industry certifications that's highlighted in blueprint, they actually go together. Blueprint requires that by the year 2030, 2031, that at least 45% of our students have an apprenticeship or an industry certification. This also aligns with the strategic plan as you have charged us to have at least 45% of our students with a work-based learning experience by the year 2025. So work has begun to expand these opportunities for our students. A grant has been secured to provide professional development to our internship coordinators, our CCICs, to make sure they understand what apprenticeships are. Um, the grant will also assist us in making sure that we hire our own students as apprentices to give them opportunities to 
explore the various occupations that exist in MCPS, as Ms. Harris mentioned earlier. We're also extending our partnership, our relationship with Urban Alliance so that they can serve as an intermediary for us to find employers because we have to have employers in order to have apprentices. So that work is undergoing as well as marketing. So we definitely want to make sure that all of our stakeholders understand what apprenticeships are, the value and the benefit that comes with it. So definitely want to thank um, also Mr. Sean Crossa, our work-based learning supervisor who is leading that effort. Career counseling is also a part of Blueprint. We are required to contract with the local workforce development board and hire them to provide career counseling to all of our middle and all of our high school students. It is expected that this will be implemented in 2024. We have just started meeting with the local workforce development board. They understand that this is a heavy lift for, our, um, for them and for us, we have over 87,000 secondary students. And so what would that look like? How would it roll out? There are a lot of questions that still has to be answered around career counseling, but they have assured us that they are up for the challenge. And we will be working collaboratively with them as well as our partners at Montgomery College, USG, and our business stakeholders to stand this work up. We have asked that they include career competencies in the career counseling work. It is critically important for our students to be college career and community ready. It is not sufficient that they are proficient in English and math. They have to have the skills that enable them to succeed when they leave us. And, and just so that we're on the same page in terms of vernacular, when I say career competencies, these are skills that used to be referred to as soft skills. Mm -hmm. But we know that mm -hmm. words matter. Mm -hmm. And these are not soft skills. They are important. They are critical. They are essential. And, and we have labeled them career competencies. And the we in this effort, MCPS, Montgomery College, and USG, with the support of our executive leaders, we have been moving forward over the last two years to stand up and be intentional about making sure that our students have these competencies before they leave us. We heard loud and clearly from our industry leaders that our students are smart. Our students have technical skills, but not all of them master the career competencies that they need to see. And so we want to definitely embrace that work and work collaboratively with the Workforce Development Board in standing up that work. <coughs> On the next slide, if you would please. These are the competencies that we have reviewed and finalized between the three institutions. They are heavily, heavily based on the research that's been done and completed by the National Association of Colleges and Employers with additional <coughs> research as well. We all agreed that the ninth competency was critical to add to all of the competencies listed. We tried very hard not to rank competent, the competencies. We recognize that they're all equally important, but personal well-being stands out and it has to be elevated. It's challenging to say that you're competent in any of the competencies when you're not personally well. You can't be a master of leadership when you're not personally well. So I get kind of emotional about that one. <coughs> get it together. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. So fortunately, our partners agree. That's important to elevate and so it's the ninth competency and it's critically important. So workforce learning, um, I'm sorry, the Workforce Development Board will be including career competencies in the career counseling that must go forward starting in FY24. Speaking of counseling, I believe, next slide, we'll transition to Dr. Karen Cruz to continue the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. Good evening. <clears throat> As Dr. Floyd shared, there are a variety of career experiences provided to students K through 12, as noted in slide 11. She beautifully showed um, all of the various um, experiences that students receive and with the beautiful diagram that she provided. I'm going to share a few additional student experiences that take place at the secondary level. Throughout middle school, students began to learn more about careers by attending all of the various career fairs that we offer and receiving classroom lessons about various career options and the CTE programs that we offer here in MCPS. 
This is also, also the time when students begin to learn about colleges by attending college fairs. And please excuse me if I slur, I had oral surgery this weekend, so I apologize. <clears throat> we provide two district-wide college fairs that are open for all middle school students and families to attend and engage with college representatives and our alumni as well. Throughout high school, students and parents have an opportunity to attend several district-wide and local college fairs to learn more about college <coughs> majors, scholarships, and the overall life of a college student, which we feel is very important to not just learn about colleges, but what is it like to be a college student. In addition, um, students and parents will also attend financial aid nights and college admissions information evening events. Students are able to hear from recent graduates as they tell their stories of lessons learned and suggestions on how to make the most of their high school years. High school students also update their course planner, um, also known as the four-year or the five-year plan, and in some places they call it a six-year plan. This is a tool we use to help students map out the actual courses that they want to take based on their post-secondary pursuits and interests. Next slide. This is our course planner data for 2021-2022. As you can see during the first two years of our implementing the course planner, um, the percent of students creating a course plan was much higher than in the past two years. We experienced a dip in the data basically due to the logistical challenges and the critical priorities that we experienced during the pandemic. Next slide. So moving forward, we recognize the high variability that occurred with students accessing and engaging with the course planner and all of the other areas of the Navias platform throughout the pandemic and throughout virtual instruction. This year, we want to reduce that variability by supporting schools with developing plans for implementing the course planner and the overall scope and sequence with fidelity. Over the course of the year, we will provide professional development on the scope and sequence and monthly data reports for our counselors and college and career information coordinators. We will also partner with our OSSWB colleagues and share the data reports monthly with them as well. Next slide. I want to take a moment to highlight some of our new supports and partnerships that we have this year. The Equal Opportunity Schools partnership will continue. And this year, we are adding dual enrollment to the program as a pilot in four of our schools. Those four schools are Clarksburg High School, Magruder High School, Gaithersburg High School, and Seneca Valley. The ACES program will also continue to operate in 14 of our high schools. In addition, this year, the program will expand to include 9th and 10th grade students as well. Next slide. Our College Tracks program is currently located in five MCPS high schools. This year, we are adding a virtual out-of-school time support for students to receive college admissions and financial aid support. Also, the CREA program, Career Readiness Education Ac Academy, is now offered during the day at both Thomas Edison High School and Seneca Valley High School. And Thomas Edison High School will also have a night program. <coughs> All of these partnerships support rigorous programming and college and career readiness for our students of color. Next slide. This year, um, we're also excited about the state um, requiring all school districts and schools to complete a FAFSA, or Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and MISFA, or Maryland State Financial Aid Application Outreach Plan. We recognize that completing the FAFSA and the MISFA can be a daunting task. The FAFSA is specifically for students that are U.S. citizens, and the MISFA is for students of undocumented immigrants who are eligible for in-state tuition. We have created and submitted a district-wide plan to the Maryland Higher Ed Commission and the Financial Aid Advisory Council. In addition, each 
individual high school has completed a plan for their school. All MCPS high schools also provide financial aid nights for students and parents to receive education about both the FAFSA and the MISFA, as well as individualized support for completing both documents. Next slide. Dr. Pugh will now provide you with more details of how we will assess our efforts and future considerations. Thank you. So it's important that we hold ourselves accountable to our students and to our families and to our community as we implement all of the strategies that were talked about tonight. Um, some of the data you're used to seeing and you would have seen it on a routine basis, so the college and career readiness data is an annual report, knowing now that it will change in the future based on the limited definition that the state has is important. Also the post-CCR pathway data, who has access to them and how we have to strategically work with our partners to build pathways that are accessible to our students in all of our high schools. And then you typically would have received FAFSA and MISFA information about the number of students completing those um, important financial planning documents. Um, what it, we will have this year is the academic planning data through the use of the, the academic tool through the counseling services. So we'll be able to monitor that on a monthly, ba monthly basis in order to support schools in making sure that the students are all having these experiences that were coordinated and planned. Um, we will bring graduation rates, last year's graduation rates, I think will come somewhere in the early spring. And then um, a new exit survey, which I'll speak a little bit more about here at the end. Next slide, please. So some recommendations moving forward. Um, there are going to be new college and career readiness standards, and we don't know if they're a separate set of standards or an integrated set of standards, or if they will be added to standards in each of the core areas, or if they will be required to be done and delivered separately. So there are a lot of decisions to be made. I think the approach that we've decided to take with embedding the core competencies integrated along the way is a good first step. So it won't be a surprise when, whenever we do see the new standards. Um, also the planning and implementation for the career counseling, looking through actually not only the content, but also the logistics of how we're going to make sure that our Workforce Development Board has uh, access to and that we can provide a good unified plan for all of our students. The rigorous course for every high school student is, is not a new piece. What is new is without enrollment or assessment costs. And that is another part of the blueprint that will, ha will come with a price tag. But we think it's also important because it reduces barriers for students who may not have taken those higher level classes, which are expensive or can be expensive. Um, we also are making a commitment to begin academic and career planning activities in grade five. We think uh, the earlier you expose students to the types of things that are available in their community, not just in support of MCPS, but there's a whole lot of industry here in the county, um, and, and allowing them to see and envision for what they might like to do um, is really a very important uh, part of academic planning. If we look at it as we are always career planning. We want students to be able to have a self-sufficient uh, future. And so that pathway is what's different for our students. And there are a variety of pathways to reach a career. <clears throat> ACES um, has been a very successful program in supporting students in uh, navigating successfully the college experience. And we've recommitted to working with them this year to uh, make sure that maybe we have a stronger pathway that when they leave us, many of them do go to Montgomery College, but we want to see more of them go on to the uh, uh, Shady Grove universities. So one way to do that is to, to have access to students earlier when they can start thinking about what they're going to do post-secondary. So thinking about ex expanding that for our ninth and 10th grade students. And then, next slide. So, as with everything, the anti-racist audit has to thread through and it has to be a part of every effort that we've made. Um, we will continue to coordinate around the strategic plan and the results. 
um, with the very important goal of making sure that it is coherent to our families and it is coherent to our teachers, what we're asking and supporting them in doing, that we use our accountability measures at, formatively, that we use the data to make adjustments to our practices as we move through um, building the capacity of our teachers to support more students in more rigorous coursework. And then finally, the creation of an alumni connection is, is a really interesting concept. Um, the data collection for after graduation, and I think that's been expressed, uh, Dr. McKnight spoke of it early on, is following up what, what are our, our students doing. And living with two uh, graduated students, their pathways <laughs> couldn't be any more different. And I think they would appreciate that reach out to say, what have you done with what, what, what we provided you and what could we have prepared you better for because both would have very strong opinions. Um, so uh, hearing from our students today, they have very good opinions. They're going to tell it to you honestly. So I think actually making contact with our students to find out where they are and, and help them help inform for the future youth is an important effort. Next slide. And at this point, we'll turn it back over to you, uh, President Wolf, and we'll take questions. Thank you. Does anybody have comments? Turn your lights on. Dr. Joftis. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, this was great and very comprehensive. I'm just curious what you all see as the biggest risk to making all this happen. Staffing, um, other. Because you got a lot of balls sort of <laughs> going. I'll take a, a <laughs> shot at that one. Um, I think that it, it, I don't look at it as a risk. I look at it as an opportunity because really what's happening is the landscape of Let me say threat to making this happen. <laughs> threat to making this happen. Yeah, okay. that's, that's, there are that's what I meant. And yep. probably all of them are politics and policies that <laughs> limit the type of thinking that's going to be needed to expand these programs and funding. So we will have to look at the programs that we're currently offering, especially our dual enrollment, our CTE pathways, and do an evaluation internally of what's working, um, and make our ever every effort to make sure we're doing everything to, to make them work, which is, I think, some of the marketing towards the programs, making sure students are aware, removing barriers that are there, uh, working with our state to say, can some of these courses count for where they're aligned? Um, it also is a risk in that if you think about even if 40% of our students were taking dual enrollment courses, what does that mean? Are our community colleges prepared to receive 40% of 11th and 12th grade students who still need support um, in the ways that they have traditionally? And what can we do as partners to try and first of all have access so does that mean transportation or does that mean a combination of hybrid blended virtual um, um, pathways that are available in each of the schools so I think the risk is going to be on both sides because we're both going to have to change how we've done business traditionally and come together with a, a better pathway and it will cost Dr. And Dr. staffing. And staffing. <laughs> I certainly can. And I, I don't want to sound self-serving since dual enrollment is under me, but I anticipate that this is a wonderful opportunity, as Dr. Pugh has said, and it will only expand and grow. And so in order to lift this up, we definitely will need to rely on many central service staff. And staffing will be impacted. And so I anticipate there would be a need for additional staffing. And that's one example. Thank you. Dr. Daka. Um, I want to thank you for all the work that you did and the explanations that we were able to read uh, prior to this and to the uh, PowerPoint uh, about the career and technology and, uh, and the fact that we have a place here. They can go to Montgomery College and they can go to USG. And uh, I did go to the inauguration for Dr. Jermaine Williams. Most of you were there. But he actually talked about getting students from MCPS. I had not heard that before. It's like these students materialized, but <laughs> MCPS didn't have anything to do with it. So I was so glad he said that. And he also said he wanted them to know about Montgomery College and the opportunities by seventh grade. And that fits in with our fourth uh, four-year plan. 
Um, I was glad to hear him say that, and he wants more students to come from MCPS. So thank you for all of the information, and I particular, particularly like Naviance because it kind of walked me through what Naviance can do, and uh, I think it's tr a tremendous program, and I know that you work hard on that. And speaking of the four-year plan, every once in a while we'll have a parent say, I don't know what that is. I didn't hear about it. Well, I know that you told them, and I know that it was on uh, email, and, uh, and that they sent it in newsletters. I'm sorry they missed it. But it really is very important because kids really know, really need to know what they need to plan for by 12th grade. Because if they do it in 11th grade, it's a little late. They may not be able to get some of the courses they really want. But I won't go into all of that because we heard from the kids about needing to take all these courses and wanting electives. I have some comments on that. It has to do with scheduling, but I'll save it. <laughs> I just want to tell you how very proud I am of Montgomery County Public Schools because this is an opportunity and you've taken it as an opportunity instead of saying, oh my God, how are we going to do this? Which we're hearing from a lot of our LEA partners in, around the, the um, the state. So I, I'm just impressed by the amount of thought that you've put into this already. And of course, there are going to be challenges, but I know that we can rise to the occasion and maybe we'll have to pivot a little bit and make some adjustments. But at least the commitment and the desire to, to serve our students is there. So I just want to say thank you for the amount of work and thought that you put into this. Ms. Silvestri, I think I saw your light on. I'm just going straight down yeah, the Yeah, I wasn't turning on because other people were on. Yeah, so the, the title of the presentation was College Career and Community Readiness a gradu and Graduation Preparation. I think it should be and post-graduation preparation, right? Because this is not just getting us to the finish line, but getting us beyond the finish line to the, whatever that post-graduation uh, opportunity is for our young people. And I really want to commend the staff, uh, Ms. Sharon, that worked on the strategic plan because it was very forward thinking. You all, I think, knew that these things were coming down the pipeline with the blueprint, with dual enrollment, with what we wanted to do with, with uh, Navion's post-pandemic, and really built it into the strategic plan and set measures. So we, we have a measure of 73 percent uh, post-secondary enrollment for this year. So we already have a goal to be working towards with our, within our strategic plan. So I really want to commend uh, Ms. Sharon and all the people. I know she worked with several areas of the, of the system to really put a, a good plan together there. Um, so I wanted to ask a few questions. Um, can you say more about what happens to students that are not college and career ready? You said that we will do interventions, but what does that mean? Yes. In fact, the previous legislation required that we document the interventions at hand because we realized not all students were going to meet that measure. So previously, they, the interventions consisted of Khan Academy, summer school, after school tutoring, things of that nature, specific modules. Moving forward, Blueprint actually requires that we work in collaboration with our community college to develop courses that may assist with this kind of support. So it might be a developmental course in English and math, something of that nature, but supports that will increase their likelihood of assessing ready upon reassessment. Previously, I'll add also, that it also con considered CTE opportunities. And so students who were involved in a final course in a CTE program, that was considered support and a transitional opportunity. And so this year we're hoping that opportunities like that will also be considered to be support moving forward. Okay. Okay. I would just add the one thing we don't know is, is the reassessment requirement, right? Because the goal is that they meet that benchmark, that threshold. So uh, we worked really hard in the past to make sure that these transition courses were preparing them for the next step and not remediating them for in the past, you know, previous. Um, so they could take an exam and we worked with our communities worked with their colleges to make sure that the 11th grade um, assessment of the 11th grade English transition course was aligned with uh, a, a college course. So 
I think there's opportunity here because the law isn't specific on it yet for advocacy around um, not making it go back and take an English 10 exam, um, which it, when students don't pass the English 10 exam, is it a true indicator? That's why the school superintendents and them have worked so hard to look at other things that statistically did make sense. The, the GPA is what the community college president said had more uh, reliability in a predictor of the future of that student. So more measures rather than less. Okay, great. And I, um, this is the first time I've, I'm hearing this about working with the higher ed institution to figure out what that, that course or that intervention might be. But, but it makes sense because I have heard from higher ed that um, it's, they're not necessarily aligned. What's being taught in the high school is not necessarily aligned to what college level math and college level English is. And so I think kind of that closer collaboration will be a benefit for our students. Um, a quick question, apprenticeships. I don't know very much about apprenticeships in MCPS, but how many do we have? Because there's a 45% goal, which seems like a lot. And if I don't know of any apprenticeships in the system, this sounds like we have a long ways to go. We have a very long ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few. Um, and, and every forum, we're sort of uh, advocating it. What I'm finding, you know, when we first start, when I was part of first starting it in another district, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen, even in conversations with businesses here. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a work on the part of the business. It also is a risk, and they also have to pay. So you really have to do that convincing and that real tight match of having the right student matched for the right job. And we learned a lot about what not to do, so I think we have some ideas about how to move forward, increasing both Montgomery County Public Schools' use of apprenticeships in the wide variety of areas that we have, but also in looking at our industry partners who are already partners through the um, pro professional advisory committees, oh, the program, advisory committee. program advisory committees. There's an acronym for everything: mm -hmm. PACs and yeah. LACs, and you call it something else here. But um, no, I'm I'm excited about that because I think what it does is it doesn't put them in a three-year or four-year pathway of specific and strategic courses that they take. It opens up industries beyond those that are MSDE approved for CTE but yet it is still a CTE approved pathway to graduation. So it allows a lot of flexibility for um, students to explore careers that they might be interested in and uh, a person to mentor them while they're being paid and also earn their uh, high school diploma. I'll put in a quick plug for uh, BCC Foundation is doing a lot of work in this area and is very interested in making their work system wide, not just. Which area? Apprentice. apprentice and mentorship and um, yeah. um, my next comment is about um, so a lot of the things that we create for students are students vote with their feet to go to these activities and so how do we what's your best thinking in terms of how do we reach those that we have not reached so far so even before the pandemic, we, were re we weren't reaching 10 to 15% of our students through Navion's completion or so forth. There's always gonna be a population that is, uh, is more of a challenge for us to reach, uh, underserved. And so I don't have a, an idea, but maybe you do or are thinking about it, but unless we make everybody check the box, and there's always going to be students that are not going to go to that parent workshop, that are not going to go to that FAFSA event. Um, so we have to reach all of our students, right? They all need a post-secondary plan. Everybody needs a little bit more training and skills after graduation. Um, and um, I just want to make sure that we're not leaving those students behind in our planning. So even looking, you know, when you had very high uh, academic planning being done, it's still at 80%. So there were still 20% of students. The barriers we still have to investigate as to why that happens or, or what it is, but my suspicion is it's these lessons are done by counselors in other classes. So if you were absent on that day when that counselor was in your class doing these lessons, then you didn't have access to it. 
um, it's also one of priorities, right? What class are you going to give up class time to do this? So we have to make that barrier easier for the counselor to feel comfortable that here's the scheduled class that you're, you're going to go into. Um, but I, I think one of the best ways you can do is to get students excited about using the tool because students are the best ones to communicate to their parents what their interests are. Um, there's a part on there, I'm going to mess up the name, but um, Road Trip Nation. <laughs> road Trip Nation. My daughter did Road Trip Nation and came home and told me she wanted to be a physical therapist. And I thought, what, what in your experiences have made you want to be? We don't know any physical therapists. I haven't seen any, you know, and I was not sure. But what it did is it took her skills, she took a little skills assessment, and then it gave her a category of, of potential jobs. And then she started to look at different areas. And, and so it just, she got interested in it. I, if our kids are interested in it, then they can, at least their parents know, and most parents want to do the best that they can by the students. So then it's up to us to make sure that we're matching what those resources are that families need to be able to support that goal. So um, it's not just one thing, and I'm not sure what all of the barriers are, but I, I think some of it is logistics and not just that they're not aware or don't want to, it's the kids didn't get the information. Yep. So. And I'll also just add, um, one of the things that we are working on for this year is specifically with our school-based um, EML counselors, because the students that are EML students, we provide them with the Naviance lessons. Mm -hmm. However, we mm -hmm. don't track that data because we slow down the lessons for them to meet them where they are. And we don't expect for them to actually do the lessons in Naviance in the same way that all of the other students are doing it. And so now we're going to spend more time trying to collect that data. And so we've had those conversations with the counselors to say, when you're meeting with these students, even though we're going to take that one lesson and, and stretch it out for a whole semester, we still need to know that every student in that classroom completed that lesson. So that's one of the things that's been a barrier in the past for us that we're trying to make sure that we are cleaning up moving forward. The other thing that we've had a lot of conversations about is social media. So we know students are on social media, they're on Instagram. We've had several conversations in some schools that are actually modeling how to use students um, to go and do an IG, you know, an Instagram post about FAFSA completion or an Instagram post about, you know, I just we just finished our Naviance lesson on the course planner and, you know, we're all excited. So some of our schools have started doing that and that's another best practice that we're going to try to spread to make sure we're reaching more students. So those are just a couple of things that we're doing Great. moving forward. I'm doing a Naviance demo on Friday, so I'm looking forward to that. I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think this is a terribly exciting work. Uh, as you've heard me say, a third of our graduates are not pursuing any post-secondary education 12 months after graduation. It's getting worse. It was 25% four years ago. Now it's 33%. That's not good for our students. That's not good for our county. Um, and so this is, I think, will, will set us on a path to addressing that. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the work. Thank you for your work. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, thank you. I'll be quick because mostly what I want to talk about is what Ms. Sylvester just touched on. I'm really excited about this. I think this is going to be so beneficial. But I have a couple of concerns, um, one of them being, um, and you just kind of started to touch on it, but like what does accountability look like in this in terms of making sure that every child is actually participating because for as long as I can remember we've said that eighth graders all have a plan for high school and going on but we know that that's not actually happening necessarily so making sure that it is happening for every, each and every child and my other real big concern is just it being early enough some of these like when you're looking at the, and, and I know these numbers are difficult to judge because particularly with COVID and everything, they've gotten lower, but, you know, there are do-overs. So if you miss it and it goes too long, then you've kind of missed it and it's gone too long. And then um, opportunities are lost. And, and a lot of these things, um, 
you know, it's not even just about having um, the ability to pick what you want to do, but it's about being aware, as we've all said, of that those opportunities are there. So I just, if you could just speak a little bit to, like, I'm really excited. In fact, one in my budget priorities originally that they consolidated. One of them was a like a middle school coordinator, and I, you know, and then you had this build internship coordinator, counselor, and college career information coordinator, and stuff like that. But, but even that, that looks like a it's a long timeline to develop a position to help make this happen. Am I misunderstanding? Am I wrong? <laughs> I don't know. To make, I'm sorry. To make this, the bill, you know, you have the timeline, October 20, you know, today through June of 2024 to build an internship coordinator, counselor and college career information coordinator. Um, I, I assume that's like a position. It reads new actions, so. I'm going from your your little mem your memo here on page eight, um, and then looking at the the continued um, progression. So some of that is happening. The um, college career information coordinators. I think they're going to have a new name, but it's Aces, right? And there's not one in every school, so that would be looking at um, the effectiveness of that and who they're working with and really looking at, and they're hired through Montgomery College and right. they come into the schools. So is that model, <laughs> we believe that model is working, we believe it's a good partnership. Um, it's a matter of do we need more um, as we develop more pathways. So I think all of those are, are up for discussion. The idea that we're guaranteeing participation in these activities, I mean, that's what we want, right? Every student, no excuses. I think we have to look at the competing interests of those who are providing the services and think, is it more specialized positions or is it more integrated positions? Do you have your counselor, if your counselor is also doing mental health, wellness, a variety of things, then how do we look? future forward, how do we build it in so that, for example, one of the activities is uh, writing your own resume. It would be a perfect activity for an English class, you know, doing your own resume and then you have it housed in there as your academic sort of plan and portfolio. There's other things, um, writing your college applications, figuring out how to write a letter to people who are going to be recommendations for you, be it for a job, for the military, for, for college. So I think there's alignment. We, we have to look at the alignment in between across the curricula because mm -hmm. I do think the more you embed it in that way with the career competencies and with the access to the information in a system mm -hmm. that everybody can access, um, the more likely it is to be consistent. And I believe you're looking at the page that lists some actions mm -hmm. and apprenticeship expansion. Mm -hmm. Yes, when we listed the internship coordinators and the CCICs, that was around the professional development. The timeline there relates to the grant that we have, and it expires in 2024. Okay. So we would love to have an additional full-time staff person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But that was really around um, increasing their understanding, sharing information, professional development, so that they can help students take advantage of the opportunity. Okay. I appreciate that. Like I said, for me, it's really just about making sure that every student before grade nine understands what the possibilities are. And if we don't monitor, if we don't check it, then kids slip through the cracks. So thank you for this work. Ms. Harris. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I want to give a quick shout out. We were talking about MCPS um, apprentices, and I just want to give a shout out to the folks in Print Graphics over in Stone Street who have um, a lot of students there and are expanding that program, so they're doing amazing work there. Um, so there's one example right there. Um, and so I, I re one of the aspects of this work and expansion I'm really interested to see is I think it gives us an opportunity to look far more closely at our out uptake and outcomes. Because I know um, it, it's always puzzled me why we had um, students, um, if, for instance, going back to Edison, whose um, CTE program had a natural 
you know, kind of alliance or connection with a program at MC, and so, um, almost none of them were, were taking that opportunity. And in why, why, why was that? And and this, I think, some of the work here gets to not only measuring that, but also then doing the wraparound to, to ask them very directly. Do you, you had this opportunity, you ch chose not to take advantage of it. Why? And then you know, just really, just intentionally listening to what they tell us and what we can learn from that. Um, so I think that's a really good opportunity for us to learn um, how we can you know, really grow these programs in meaningful ways. Um, and I, I think I, I mean, I'm just going to ask this. I think I heard this when we were at the MAVE conference going to Blueprint work groups and breakout sessions, that, that Maryland higher education was going to be tasked with or required to or expected to come up with a very straightforward <laughs> series of articulations with these CTE programs because one of the things I know students have experienced <coughs> is having their accomplishments through their CTE programs very differently valued depending on where they were taking their next steps. So why could a student who did amazing work in Faya Delacon's, you know, CAD architecture program and got that industry certification, get three college credits for it at Morgan State and be told they have to take the class again at MC. So uh, what's that about and why, why? And, and again, that just gets to the, when something like that happens, asking the why. And so is, but I'm, I am hearing there's this very intentional work to standardize that through Maryland higher ed, is, did I dream that or is that? actually happening? I've not heard it, but I'd love to be a part of that dream. <laughs> because... Right. More advocacy. Here we because go. with uh, what we have in place is that we have 16 articulation agreements with Montgomery College. Yeah. But historically, those articulation credits do not transfer to the higher ed institutions. So they, if you're a student and you go to MC and you've completed one of our CTE programs, you can earn credit. But if you go on to the four-year institution, you would have to take that course again. So hopefully the conversations are happening. I've not heard it in the okay. um, I'll try to sessions that I've been a part of, but please continue <laughs> to um, share with us because I think that would be a huge, of a huge value yeah. For, yeah. for our students. Yes, and uh, yeah, I agree. And it's so, so common sense. I mean, why would you not do that? I just I don't understand. Um, and I did really appreciate, too, the emphasis on um, being personal being well-being and being well, but also the soft skills that we all know are essential to success in almost any endeavor. And um, how do you teach that? And I would just offer this, that one way um, is to ask your professionals teaching CTE and empower them to build into their curricula those skills that they know are required for those students to succeed in that industry that they're preparing them for. Because we say we're going to make you career ready, but when the school system won't let us hold, expose students to and hold them accountable to, the industry standards, they will be definitely held accountable to the minute they set foot out the door of MCPS. We're not making them college and career ready. And so, and things like just, you know, when you, when you get a schedule at work, you have to go. You have to be on time. You have to communicate with your, you know, in your chain of command. You have to communicate with your colleagues. You have to communicate with your patients, your customers, or whomever you're, you're so you, working with. You have to, can't stare at your phone. I mean, just basic things like that um, that are, though, the soft kind of collaborative skills that you have to have. And if we help them achieve them, now we are saving them so much time and effort when they leave us. So I really appreciate that that's also an emphasis here. Um, and really looking forward to, well, when we all learn what the blueprint is going to be holding us accountable to. But also, I, I mean, when I look at this timeline on, on slide six, I mean, I see there's some frustrations here. When are we going to get this? But also opportunity for us to push about the things that we know are necessary and the common sense things that we know will actually achieve the, these goals, um, like having you know Maryland higher education 
standardize their articulation agreements for these, the things that these students are achieving. So anyway, exciting, and thank you. Mr. Kim. Thank you. Um, first, wanted, uh, I'm glad so many people have brought up Naviance. So I was having a conversation the other day. Um, my peers and I remember in freshman year, our, our counselor would come in and we'd be like, you know, what is this website that they're teaching us about? <laughs> Now, three years later, as many of my peers are applying to college, now we're like, oh, we, we understand uh, the importance and the complexities of the program. So very much appreciated and, and wanted to share that with you all. Um, firstly, I, I think that the spike in, in the dual enrollment that you see in 2021 is so indicative of the opportunity that virtual learning presents us as a way to engage students with um, you know, these sometimes specific opportunities that otherwise they wouldn't have and, and possibly wouldn't exist. Uh, you know, there's just not enough demand at maybe one school uh, to have a program like that. So, I mean, that's just uh, an avenue to explore. There's a clear demand, a clear opportunity to provide students with the same level of education from anywhere in the county, but even, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, you know, wh whatever their situation might be, MCPS students can, can have that same access. Uh, and then I wanted to, I, I did have just one ask about this data. Um, so the, the information on AP and IB um, uh, enroll, or, or took the exam and, and met a college ready score. So that's, from what I can tell, broken down so we can see what percentage of, of each of these student groups, correct? Uh, I don't see that, that, and I think that's valuable in, in really demonstrating you know, where might those inequities lie, what percent of students in each of these groups are we reaching. I don't see that same uh, information being reflected in you know, the dual enrollment and, and the CTE uh, information. You know, I imagine that if you take what percent of Asian students, for example, are, are in dual enrollment, that number is going to be so small, it doesn't make sense to represent it as a percentage. But even if you weigh it, and my stat teacher is going to be happy about happy that I'm asking this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> even even if you weigh it, I think you know having that information to, to really be able to see where those disparities might might lie, you know, uh, reflective of uh, of our um, the diversity in our student population. Uh, I I just think that having that information is so crucial, especially as we talk about expansion. Uh, I think it takes a really deliberate effort to make sure that as we roll out new opportunities and expand current opportunities making sure that they're, they're reaching uh, you know, all student groups equally uh, is really crucial. Without that deliberate effort, I don't think that's what you're, a pattern you're, you're going to see. So, uh, but, uh, but otherwise, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you for that comment. And if I might add to the point, the first point you made about the spike, we were surprised at that too. We know that COVID presented so many challenges to so many of our students, and not all of them thrived in the virtual format. But many of them did. And so this fall, we are standing up our virtual middle college program. And so far, we have 142 students who are a part of that. And this provides them the opportunity to earn an associate's degree completely online, because that's the mode of learning that they prefer. And so we're going to see how that goes. But that was one learning that came out of that spike you see. Well, thank you for sharing with us. I'm really excited by this. I'm really excited to hear about your virtual learning opportunities yes. because, you know, I really think that's the way to provide equity to a lot of our to a lot of our students who are in buildings that certain programs are not offered in. So thank you again. Excellent presentation. I look forward to you coming back. I'm particularly interested. I'm going to tell you right now in your competencies writing because I've been on the thing about writing our students in my estimation, could use some help in that area. Very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Danielle, you're up next. Come on down, as they say. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> I'm just waiting for my PowerPoint to come up. So first of all, I just want to say one of my <clears throat> one of my many favorite parts of my job is that I get to see things from the beginning to 
the middle, the end, right? So this will be my fifth legislative session with you all. And in my first le legislative session, that we were working on the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So to advocate for the blueprint and to talk about it for years and then to come to the table right after folks just talk to you about some of the implementation really makes me proud of the work that, that I get to do for all of you. So tonight, um, the purpose of my presentation is to share our annual priorities um, and to get your approval for those priorities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So I want to share a couple of things. The, um, the board's leadership team and I work together to really try to focus our work a little bit more on our legislation. So the first thing is just a theory of action. Um, so, so really trying to think about what are we trying to do when we advocate. Um, the final column on, on our goal is actually the core purpose of the board as shared on your throughout your documentation. I think the really important column here, though, is that middle column because that's where you see change. And so the first column in terms of, I, mean, I know I'm doing it backwards, of what we advocate for are the things you've seen many times. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but what I really wanted to focus, for example, we always talk about funding legislative mandates. Nobody wants to be told what to do and not be given any money to do it. So how do we, how does that make any difference to us? Well, it makes a difference because we don't have to impact things that we then have to take money away from other policies. So this is just kind of a simple example, and then we get to kind of the board's point. Next slide, please. So the, the idea of focusing um, is because there are, uh, so last session, 3,114 bills were dropped. Of those bills, um, only 783 were enacted. So um, I've actually done a lot of research on the number of bills and what makes bills move and what makes bills not move as, as part of other work. And, um, and there's, a, there's a real conversation about bills that come back every year, bills that are kind of repetitive, that aren't really getting going anywhere, and how do we focus on them. Um, and so I have met with, uh, I meet with all of our delegates individually. I've met with 21 of the 32 so far. I plan to meet with the rest before session begins on January 11th. This was the document I shared with them because our priorities were not ready and I don't share those until you guys have approved them. And what, as you know, those four goals on the side are your four annual goals. And so I wanted to share those with the delegation and say, this is how we're really going to focus our work. And um, the second side of that slide is just to show that it, there's not a real change in our position. There's a change in our focus. Next slide, please. So I think I talked too fast. Um, so what we did is we went back to look at the priorities that we generally have, but we wanted to reorganize them to align them both with your annual goals, goals and with your strategic goals. So as you see, similar to what you saw um, with the other team that was up here, across the bottom are the three goals, the strategic goals to follow the strategic plan. We then realigned what the priorities were and cleaned them up to really focus on going back again, connecting those three goals with the four annual goals, how are we going to make sure that we focus our advocacy? Um, so next slide, please. So what I did, and I know I shared these with you in the memo, um, I wanted to just give you some very quick examples of when we advocate, when we don't advocate, and why this is important. One of the reasons that, the, that this is important is so that I don't have to bring every single bill before you. So last year, we weighed in on about 216 bills. Um, I did not bring every one of them to you because I could look at the platform and say, if this bill talks about, for example, including the Holocaust in the curriculum, this was an actual bill two years ago. Um, Everyone's kind of instinct is, sure, why not? Why wouldn't we support that? Well, actually, we would oppose that. I wouldn't bring it before you. I would oppose it based under the platform because it's local autonomy. It's really important that boards of education determine what is in our curriculum. The, the state decides the standards, but we decide. You decide. Um, and, and so we, I would advocate against that immediately. I wouldn't have to bring it to you. I would share it to you in memo format, as I normally do. Next slide, please. The second one is, a, is an example of a bill that I would bring to you. It does not fall cleanly underneath the um, platform because some could say, OK, well, it falls under health and well-being. Well, if we say everything falls under something, then it becomes really easy to get the whole kitchen sink. So the reason I would say this one, this is an actual bill as well. Um, this is a bill from last year. I'm sorry, from two years ago as well, um, is that there's a financial cost to this. This is beyond a well-being um, uh, component of your, of, of your planning. So this is something I would bring before you with a recommendation from Cabinet. Um, I think they're called core team now. But I will be sharing with them first. And then we would bring it before you and allow you a vote and an opportunity to say, 
we want to support that or not support that. And then my last example slide, next slide please. So here's a good one um, that, that would be something that we wouldn't, I wouldn't bring to the table. So last year we did talk about some gun bills because of some things that had happened. And that was part of where the conversation came in to say, how do we focus? Because with 3,114 bills, we could weigh in on all of them. I could make an argument, many of you could make an argument on the connection to health or well-being or education of our community and our kids. Every bill is important. So this allows us to really focus. All of that being said, these are your priorities. If there is a bill that comes up that isn't in any of this that you want to address, obviously you can bring it to the board, you can send it to me and I will bring it to you. Um, so this is just to direct the work, to really kind of focus our efforts on, on accomplishing your four goals as well as the three strategic goals. So that's it for me. I'm gonna um, turn it back over to you, Ms. Wolf, for questions and then eventually I need a vote. Okay, um, I noticed that you need a vote to approve the priorities. Now, state for me exactly what you're looking for a vote on. This. This. Uh, yes. That part. Okay. You should have had a copy of this with your memo, and then it is on slide four. So these are our priorities. What would happen is that the back of this gets the at a glance data, and we have this printed really nicely, and I carry it around with me and hand out copies to the legislation. We'll, legislators will hand them one on December, um, November 17th at our breakfast meeting, and um, they usually carry it all around with them too. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Ms. Evans? Yes. Um, just, could you just clarify that um, this hasn't changed that much from last year. All you did was categorize so there, it under our Correct. There are priorities. no additions in terms of I haven't added anything new that I'm asking you guys to support that you have not supported in the past. It's just organized a little differently. It's tighter and cleaned up a little more. Thanks for that question. You Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Can I get a motion? So um, move approval. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Arvin, did you want to say something? Oh, okay, your light was on, so <laughs> I didn't know whether you did or not. All right, we're now up to <clears throat> item number 11, consent items. Is there anything anybody wants to pull? Yes. Um, I had it a second ago. Yeah. <laughs> you want eleven point. Oh, here it is. One. Yeah, but it's do. Do I tell you the specific uh, one that I would like pulled? When when we get okay. to it, okay. but it's 11.1 you want to pull, right? Yeah. Ms. Wolf, okay. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Mr. Hull just ran to his office to get a, a document regarding uh, these items. Uh, so I wonder, is there anything we can Well, we can move him, item 11.2, yeah. unless anybody has any concern about that. Can I get a motion to move 11.2? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Okay, while, while he's waiting, can we move items 12.1 through 12.3 in block? So moved. Second. And any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. <coughs> is there any new business? Seeing none, can... Um, Item number 13 is for information only, so we'll just wait for Mr. Hall to come back. Give him a minute. I, it has occurred to me that I may have been able to answer my own question, but um, if a contract is extended, my question was, was it for the same dollar amount as previously, or was this a new um, amount? And I'm not sure if you know or if Mr. Adams knows because it's a program issue but if it's an extension is it the exact same amount of money as previously or does it change oh for the RAP program is, is specifically what I'm asking about 
sometimes the extension is more depending on what the service is or you know it may be that the cost is a little bit different at the time is there a specific one it was in reference to the recovery and academic programs i just wanted to make sure it wasn't we weren't reducing money funding for it because they are hoping to expand the program no it's it's really just an extension and sometimes like i said it can be more more money depending okay. on what the needs are um and the cost of okay. the difference in the cost okay thank you thank you And I bet 9.15, so hurry up, pick it up. Pick it up. Yeah. So go ahead, um, go ahead, Dr. Joftis. So I would like to pull, is that what we're doing now? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to pull 92.15.2. Uh, Athletic field maintenance, artificial turf at various locations. Okay, go ahead with your question. Um, so is the idea here that we are re re we're replacing existing turf with new turf? So this particular item is purely a maintenance uh, item that relates to existing turf field. So. Uh, this particular item is strictly focused on replacing or replenishing the infill of existing turf systems. So uh, it's, it's not replacing the entire turf field itself. This is maintenance work required to, uh, to address infill of, of several of our fields. Okay, so um, I'm trying to think what my question is. I, I think, so is it, is it possible um, to consider rather than um, rather than replacing the what do you call it the infill, infill. infill. with um, with a different field altogether do we have a sense of um, I, I guess again this goes to what I was saying before is I don't want to I don't want to invest in extending something that I pretty much want to replace right um, and so I don't know, if, is there that kind of analysis? Maybe that's the way that, to ask it. Well, well so, so I would say this is, um, you know, this is to keep an ongoing system, that, an investment, uh, you know, the longevity required, you know, in order to, to, to seek its full, full performance. So um, if there's an interest in actually removing uh, turf fields, that's a very different endeavor and, and an extremely costly endeavor because it is um, removing the infrastructure that we previously installed. Everything from, you know, the, the under drainage systems to, you know, the, the substrates to, to obviously, you know, the, the, the turf itself. Um, but I, I would just highlight, you know, the, the one element I, I did hear a little bit around, you know, our, our, our turf fields. Um, the, the reason we really look at our high school stadium fields for artificial turf um, is truly from a playability standpoint, from, from a keeping students on campus standpoint, as well as opening up these fields to community users. We've heard a lot about equity of different spaces. You know, these are the fields that have lights, that have, you know, community users allowed to use our artificial turf fields. When we think about our stadium fields or competition fields, they are, and they're, if they are not artificial turf, they are purely used for competition. Uh, so if there's if there's practices that need to happen, a lot of times you're you're off you're moving off site with students for those practices. If there's a rain event, you know el, you know ac activities are canceled. Um, a couple of years ago in the in the springtime, uh, Dr. Sullivan talked about you know the artificial turf fields that we have basically saved the spring season because we had so much rain and all events were sort of rescheduled to those fields to allow those activities to go on. So we we obviously we we look at these fields as 
as, as critical in, in terms of, of just having students maintain a, a safe, um, high quality ath athletic experience. Um, but beyond that, we do, we are fully invested in natural grass fields. So, you know, all, all of our other fields, um, including you know, middle schools, elementary schools, practice fields, you know, baseball, softball at the high school level, secondary level, we, we are investing in uh, newer technology, working with the Parks Department to look at the natural grass. But the stadiums, we have historically, we are looking for, um, you know, obviously continue to see if we can expand them because of the equity and the access to those fields, just from a, a one field perspective model. We're looking to expand the artificial turf fields? Yes. yes. So, so right now it's at 12 high schools and um, we have five high schools that are part of either in design, uh, moving into construction. Obviously two of them are brand new high schools. Uh, the other are renovations to high schools that we are um, ex you know, moving forward from a design standpoint as artificial turf just in the stadium field itself. Uh, but that's obviously something the board can, can act on and vote on when we come to preliminary plans presentations to have discussions or even at any other time if there's a, uh, if there's a desire to change course. Okay, thank you. Well, and I did just want to add that if we do that, we can definitely bring the fiscal implications of that. Um, I believe a few years ago we had done some work, work around this and did some comparison in terms of cost. Um, so we're happy to be able to bring that back forward because I do believe if we did intend to, the Board of Education decided to go um, a different route, it would be something that, that would have to be planned for financially as well as um, a plan for um, implementation over time. Ms. Harris? Yeah, um, because I, I, I mean, there's also the safety. I mean, you know, the, the turf fields just are harder on the body. And we see that in our young athletes all the time. And, you know, we don't want them to be experiencing, you know, career ending injuries as high school students. Um, so that's another concern around the turf. At, but my one question is, as we, we, you know, the technology evolves all the time in this area. And so are we, how are we programming in continuously staying on top of um, the kind of both capacity and technology advancements that are allowing installation of well, of, of grass fields that are high impact playable on, at the level that it seems to be kind of the tipping point for why we decide to install turf because of it allows for more playing time. But how are we staying abreast of the emerging technology and capacity that might um, might say we can actually, if it's done well, install a grass field that is has the same kind of playability? And, and, and that's an excellent question. And, and I would say you know we um, we certainly can come back with with more of the data. But I think much of uh, what we find is, 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 is purely from experience at both the park level and both at the school level. When you have a rain event, um, you need to preserve your natural grass fields and, and those fields close. Um, the, the artificial turf fields, and again, we have spent a considerable amount of time, we have some of the, the best activists and, and most educated individuals in this county. Uh, we, we have done cutting edge research here in Montgomery County just around how to make artificial turf fields better, how to make them safer, how to reduce heat effects. Um, you know, so I, I, I do believe we have a lot of the data that, that supports the decisions. Again, we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're very data focused. So, you know, this isn't just guesswork. Um, you know, it is something that we, we spend an incredible amount of time doing, obviously, investigation up front, but also once it's installed, you know, going out, working with our athletes, working with Dr. Sullivan, but also doing the testing that's required to make sure it is safe. Um, we have talked to Dr. Sullivan about that, that sort of anecdotal uh, element of more injuries. That, that was the case with the older turf systems, you know, and, and that's something that we track and we compare from, from one field to, to the other. But um, I would say we, we do have the data to support, you know, the decisions that, uh, that have been made, the investments that have been made, and we try to publish as much of that as we can on our website. So we have a very robust uh, website that shows test data and, and other, um, other research that we have performed over the years. Any other questions? All right, can I get a motion to move 11.1? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. 
and that is unanimous. And I think now I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Did we move the others in block? Yes, we, we, we finished everything else. Okay, move to adjourn. <laughs> I proudly second. It's hard to believe, isn't it? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you.